Thanks. Good morning. Yeah, we, the seminar is going to be in three parts. There are three of us who are dividing the time here. We do have a good amount of time. We're going to go into uh, quite a bit of detail on these topics. So please feel free to uh, stop, uh, stop us and ask questions at any moment if you don't understand something. I think we need to maybe find some blank uh, foils and pens to explain things on the view graph. But if you don't mind just sort of waving our hands to answer a question, you know, we can do that at any time. We've divided the seminar into three uh, sections. I'm going to talk about sort of the basics of spread spectrum, the theory behind it all, why you'd like to use it, you know, where it makes sense, where it doesn't make sense, and so forth. Uh, Tom is then going to talk about this really nifty frequency hop uh, spread spectrum radio they've been designing. They talked about uh, briefly yesterday uh, for amateur use. And then Dwayne will, will uh, finish up with uh, a talk about rules and regulations and the uh, regulatory issues involving the use of spread spectrum in the amateur service. I'm going to talk, this is an overview of my section of the talk, um, starting with some fairly basic ideas that are really very crucial so, to, to understanding spread spectrum, so I want to spend some time on it, make sure you really understand them, and talk about why spread spectrum is interesting, why we should, um, and later on, like, I also complement the talk by showing places where it doesn't make sense to use spread spectrum. It's not a panacea, it's just yet another tool in the toolbox that can be used where it's appropriate. Uh, talk about the coding modulation and spreading aspects of, uh, of, a, of, a real, of several real systems. Uh, synchronization and tracking, which is something that tends to scare off a lot of people about spread spectrum. Uh, you know, this is not black magic. It's actually not that much different from the synchronization and tracking methods you're already familiar with for things like PSK modems, constant loops, and so forth. They have direct equivalents in spread spectrum. Uh, talk about uh, some of the uh, trade-offs between uh, frequency hopping and direct sequence in real systems. Uh, they each have their advantages and disadvantages, and I'll talk about those. Uh, I'll, I'll, and then I'll conclude by talking about several real systems, uh, the one, at least the ones that I'm familiar with, and show how spread spectrum has been applied in those systems and why certain design choices were made and where they were made, and then and wrap up. Okay, here's some very basic concepts, and it's really important to understand these, so I'm, I'm willing to spend as much time as necessary so that you really do understand what these mean. Uh, these sound like big words, and they, they sound very theoretical, but they are really crucial to understanding not just uh, spread spectrum communications, but communications in general. Okay? These are the terms correlation and orthogonality. Uh, you hear them a lot in, in, in talks on spread spectrum. You hear about things like correlators and, and uh, orthogonal codes and so forth, but these are really not new terms. Okay? It's very important to understand. These, these are terms that have been around for a long time in analog communication. We're just using these using them in a somewhat different way with spread spectrum. Okay. Correlation is a time average product to input functions. More mathematically speaking, it's, a, it's an integral over some period of time of two functions that have been multiplied together. But you can think of an amateur terms as, a, as multiplying two functions and taking the average over some period of time. And how you would normally do that in, in an analog receiver is as follows. You'd have a multiplier, which is also known as a double balance mixer or a product detector, followed by a low-pass filter, or in the case of band-limited signals, a, a band-pass filter. Okay, so this, this is the multiplication function. This essentially does an integral over time. It's an averaging function over time. Okay? And this is an extremely common building block in analog receivers. So this is nothing really new to spread spectrum. We're just feeding different signals into the multiplier. But we're, used, we're doing exactly the same operation that's been done for many, many years in conventional uh, analog receivers and transmitters. So they say mixers and product detectors are, are existing examples of, of these functions. Okay. And I'll define the, the function or term orthogonality. Two functions are orthogonal if when you multiply them together in one of these uh, correlators, the result is zero or nearly zero. Okay. Uh, you can see many examples of this in conventional analog communications. If you tune a receiver to a given channel, all other channels should, in theory, be orthogonal to the one you're listening to. That is, the receiver does not respond to the, to the other frequencies. That's all, that's all orthogonality means, is that you can tune a receiver to reject a signal that is orthogonal to the one that is, that is uh, tuned to select. So, restating what I just said, if two communication signals are orthogonal, then it is at least theoretically possible to build a receiver that responds to one of these signals and completely rejects the other. Now, of course, in practice, there, there's, there are limits to this. I mean, I can build crystal filters that have skirts to drop down 60 dB pretty quickly, but 60 dB is not infinite. But in practice, that's, that's usually good enough. Okay? But we cannot build real receivers that are absolutely perfect, but at least in theory we can. Okay? Now, if the two signals are not orthogonal, okay, then this is not possible even in theory. This is an important thing to understand about spread spectrum. 
that many of the signals we'll be using differentiate users, you know, one user from another, are not perfectly orthogonal. What that means is that I cannot even in theory build a spread spectrum receiver that responds only to one of those signals. It will respond to all of them, although it may respond to the one I want more strongly than the ones I don't want. Okay, so this is a this is the difference between spread spectrum and conventional analog narrowband communication. We give some examples of orthogonal functions. Uh, the ones that most hands are already very familiar with are sine waves. Okay, this is how we divide up the spectrum. We give a, we give a different sine wave function to every user, and because they're orthogonal with each other, it's possible to build transceivers that respond to one and, and ignore all the rest. Okay, so examples would be a sine wave is either different frequency or two sine waves of the same frequency but in phase quadrature, that is, at uh, 90 degrees apart from each other in, in phase. Yeah, I can build, for example, two P, uh, PPSK radios, and if I can operate them in phase quadrature, I can operate them so they won't interfere with each other, even though they're on the same frequency. Okay. Uh, other examples of orthogonal functions in, in everyday use are uh, pulses that don't overlap in time. Uh, this is an example of time division multiple access. If I share a channel in time, I can think of that as, as signaling with a function that is a, a square pulse in time that turns on and turns off for me and then turns on and turns off for someone else. And as long as they don't overlap in time, we don't interfere with each other. I can build a receiver that gates on only during my time slot and turns off during everyone else's time slot. So again, we have a set of orthogonal functions which respond only to one, uh, which can only, which, if you can use a set of orthogonal functions here so that you can build a receiver that responds only to one of those functions, whichever one you want to select. Uh, the use of sine waves is, is generally known as frequency division multiple access, and this is fundamental. Even, even systems that are spread are, are spread only at one level, and down below, down at the very bottom, they, they're still FDMA. For no other reason, the FDC still allocates frequency bands. You know, we don't spread over the entire spectrum from DC to daylight. We spread over some piece of it. So at some level, even a spread spectrum system is still frequency division multiple access. You very often find co combinations of these. A packet system is inherently TDMA in the sense that you're only transmitting for part of the time. Hopefully, you're only transmitting when no one else is transmitting. Okay, so, you're, so very often, these systems are actually, real-world systems are actually combinations of all these techniques. Okay. Another example of orthogonal function is something called a Walsh function, which has become very important in the CDMA systems that we work on at Qualcomm. They're being deployed now for digital cellular use. Uh, a Walsh function can be thought of as the rows of something called a Hadamard matrix, and these are actually very easy to, to construct. Uh, if you start with, for example, a negative one up here in the left-hand corner, the way you construct these matrices is you copy the existing matrix, which starts, in this case, is just a one by negative one by itself. You copy it to the right and down, and then you copy invert it diagonally. Okay, and this creates a second-order matrix. Now, I can take this whole thing and repeat the process. Copy this matrix over here, here, and then invert it here. And I can keep applying this process and make these things as big as I want, as long as they're square and have a power of two describing each dimension. Now, the interesting property of this matrix is if you take any two pairs you want, any two rows you want, in fact, any two columns, you multiply and sum each of the, of the corresponding elements of the, of the array, you always end up with zero. Okay, so, for example, we take the first two rows. Negative one times negative one is plus one. Negative one times plus one is, is negative one. Plus one, negative one, you add them up, you get zero. Okay. Take any pair of rows or any pair of columns, the property is, is guaranteed to, to, to hold. What this means is that if I use these as my orthogonal functions, rows of this matrix of orthogonal functions, I can, again, build a receiver that responds to only one of these and rejects all the others. Now, what's kind of interesting about Walsh functions, if you look at them more closely, they're really just squared off sine waves. Okay? This row here, being all negative ones, is like DC. Okay? This one is essentially a square wave at this rate. Okay? This one is a square wave at half the frequency. Okay? And this one is the same square wave but shifted 90 degrees. So does the quadrature. So all these functions are really just squared off sine waves. Okay. So when you when you read about, for example, uh, uh, the Qualcomm CDMA system using the Walsh functions as orthogonal channels in the forward link to the module to, to channelize users, that's really very fancy talk for using a bunch of subcarriers, one for each user. Okay. It's really the same thing. Mathematically, it's the same thing, except they're squared off sine waves. It's really all uh, really all they are. Okay. okay now why? Do we even want to consider going to functions for signaling that are not orthogonal? I mean, we have, you know, for many years we've used narrowband radios that use, you know, functions that at least in theory, sine waves are perfectly orthogonal. We can build receivers that respond to, to one channel and completely reject all the rest. Why, we, why would we even consider going to, to uh, using a set of functions that doesn't give us this property? Well, uh, there are several. Uh, one is that uh, the size of an orthogonal function set is limited, which is another way of saying the spectrum is limited. Okay? 
there's only so many different sine waves that I can I can pick that are all orthogonal to each other given the bandwidth of, a, of each individual user. Okay. Uh, further, now now if, if everyone were using the spectrum continuously, like a broadcaster, they get on the air and they transmit continuously, that's not so bad. Okay. But in fact, many users of the spectrum, and, and that includes hams, use the spectrum only intermittently. Okay. We get on, we transmit for for a short time, we get off, and we can't really predict or schedule when that's going to happen. And there are many more of us hands than there are channels to go around on most of our bands. Okay. So this creates an allocation problem. If you're, again, if you're a broadcaster, it's not a problem. They have 24 hours a day, unless you're a you know, broadcaster and you have the timeshare. Uh, but for many uses of the spectrum, including ham radio, our uses are very intermittent and very unpredictable. Okay. So uh, what this means is that there's only so many channels to go around. We have to find some ways of dynamically sharing those channels which can be complicated, especially if the transmissions we're making are very, very short, as they are, for example, in packet radio. Another reason why we want to look at um, these uh, other spreading functions or modulating functions other than you know, the, the ones we're familiar with is that the time shifts in most orthogonal functions are not self-orthogonal. That is, if you take a sine wave of a given frequency and you shift it in time, and you compare it with itself in a correlator, it will respond. Okay? What that means is if you're using narrowband modulation, using sine waves as your, as your channelizing functions, then time shifts of your signal, as can be generated by multipath reflection off of airplanes or buildings or whatever, uh, will be received by the receiver just as well as the original signal. Okay, what this means is that multipath interference is a problem okay, because there's no way for the receiver to reject all but one of those components. It has to respond to them all because the time shifts of these of these signals are not self-orthogonal. Okay. So here's the case for spread spectrum. There are, if you are willing to forego the perfect orthogonality, if you're willing to forego the ability to build a receiver that can completely reject all one with all unwanted signals, then there are then there are very very large sets of these functions available to this, you know, extremely large number. Okay. Uh, what this means is that everyone can have one permanently. There's no need to reallocate. There's no need to have uh, some some complex system that hands out channels or time slots when you need them and then puts them back into the pool when you're done. Everybody can have their code and they can just keep it. There's essentially, you know, un almost unlimited number of these things. Uh, some of the, many of these functions are also nearly orthogonal with time shifted versions of themselves. What this means is I can now build a receiver that responds to only one particular time delay component of the signal. Okay. This means I can now do something about multipath for the first time in mobile communications. Okay. Also, because these functions are uh, uh, orthogonal with time shifted uh, versions of themselves, Another property that comes out of this is I can now do ranging and tracking. If I want to build a navigation system, or if I want to locate the, the position of a transmitter, it's much easier to do that if I'm using a function where I can discriminate against the different time of arrival of the, that same signal. And if I can measure, if I can discriminate against time of arrival very accurately, because I can also measure the range of that signal or the time delay of the signal I'm looking at very, very accurately, which means I can get a very accurate round trip time measurement or one-way uh, time measurement, and I can use and do uh, ranging and tracking with that. Now, I, I've talked about the properties of some of these codes without really saying what these codes are. Uh, not all of these codes have these properties, but, but a very important set of codes do, called pseudonoise codes. Uh, these are codes that uh, have properties that make them look very much like noise. This is why they're called pseudonoise. But they have, uh, they're perfectly predictable. I mean, I can, I can specify them in a document. I can build a, a piece of software or a piece of hardware that generates these sequences, and they will always generate the same sequence every time. That's obviously very important. It doesn't do me any good to use true noise as my modulating function because my receiver wouldn't know how to generate the exact same sequence. It's very important to end, be able to generate the same sequence even though it may have noise-like properties. So I, there are several ways I can generate sequences like this. The most common way, in fact, the only legal way right now in the amateur service for spread spectrum is to use something called a linear feedback shift register. Uh, those of you who've ever looked at 9600 baud modems have um, probably seen the scrambler circuit in there. It consists of a shift register and feedback taps and inclusive OR gates. That's a linear feedback shift register. In fact, that's exactly what it is. It's an M sequence generator or a PN generator. Okay. That's one way to generate these pseudo those sequences, and they're very, very widely used in, in spread spectrum because they're so easy to build and have these nice properties. Uh, there are other families of codes, such as gold codes, which are derivations of the or uh, modified versions of these of these linear feedback shift register sequences. If you take several different linear feedback shift register sequences and XOR them together, 
it's, it's a sequence of that different periods, and you have what's called a gold code, and you can generate very, very large families of these of these codes, which have very good uh, cross-correlation properties. Gold codes are used in particular on GPS. Each satellite has its own gold code, so you can build a correlator response to one satellite, but treats all the other signals. Another way to build um, or generate these pseudonoids codes for spread spectrum is to generate it from some kind of cryptographic sequence. This is done most commonly in the military for anti-jam communications because if you use something like a linear feedback ship register, it turns out the math for, for understanding those things is very, very simple. And even if you pick a very long sequence, there are very simple mathematical algorithms to allow you to determine what that sequence is from a very small piece of it. We heard one paper yesterday that talked about ways of doing that. Um, so. If, if you're in a military, you know, hostile military battlefield kind of situation, and you don't want your um, adversary to be able to uh, uh, either follow your, your chipping sequence or either for interception or for jamming, you want to use a sequence that can't be predicted, so you use a cryptographic sequence of some kind. Again, this is a deterministic sequence in that two ends can still generate the sequence if they know the necessary information, but somebody who's just watching the channel in this last case can't do it. And an example of this in practice is the GPS Y code that's used to uh, scramble the, the P-channel, the precision channel in GPS, uh, to keep um, you know, us mere mortals from using it. Uh, I believe that code runs at something like 512 kilobits per second. It's generated out of a, uh, an, on one screen, uh, an onboard uh, cryptographic chip on the satellites, and then a, a, co a copy of that is generated in the quote-unquote authorized receiver on the ground so that the, 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 the scram on your encryption can be undone. But those of us who don't have access to the algorithm are able to do that. A term that you'll hear quite often in spread spectrum, especially in direct sequence spread spectrum, is a chip that is simply a bit of a code sequence. It's called a chip to distinguish it from a data bit. Chips are usually very, very short compared to, uh, at least in direct sequence systems, compared to a data bit. Um, and you use those terms to, to keep you from fusing one with each other, fusing two with each other. Okay, now, the cost of neural programming, I said earlier that um, you know, all communication systems up to the point of you know, spread spectrum was invented to use orthogonal functions. Uh, why would we want to give that up? Well, there are costs, okay? You have to be, you have to be fair about this. Um, spreading gives us some very important benefits, but it also has some costs that come with it. And you have to balance these off in, in any real system design. Uh, because these sequences are not perfectly orthogonal, there's some interference that's left. Okay? This is sometimes known in spread spectrum as the famous near-far problem. If I have... Uh, two stations that were alone on the channel, they can communicate just fine. But if I have several stations, they're all trying to communicate at the same time, and uh, two of these stations, or, or say two of these stations are very close to each other, and another, sta another station I'm trying to communicate with at the same time is much farther away, the closer station will probably have stronger power. And because I can't completely reject that station, it makes it very difficult for me to hear the one that's farther away. Okay. In, in some systems, this is not a problem. For example, in GPS, where all the satellites are roughly the same distance, this is not really a problem because they come down at almost the same signal strength. But on the ground, where you can have very, very large differences in distance to the different stations you wish to receive, this can be a problem. And in fact, it was a, it was a major unsolved problem in the use of, of CDMA for a cellular telephone system. So Falcon came along, came up with an automatic power control scheme to solve it. Uh, the interference that you get in a uh, spread spectrum system is suppressed by a ratio called a process gain. Uh, in a, again, in a narrowband system, this ratio is theoretically infinite, although real filters, of course, are not, are not perfect. So you still have a process gain even in an analog system, but that's more of a function of the, how the, the filters are implemented and how good they are. But in a spread spectrum system, you have a process gain that's an inherent function of the, the, the signal itself, and you can't do better than this no matter how good a receiver you build. Okay, the, process, the, the process gain in a, in a spread spectrum system is simply equal to the bandwidth of the spread RF component, that is the channel bandwidth on the air, divided by the data rate. Okay, now, Sometimes you'll see this shown as the bandwidth of the RF divided by the bandwidth of the baseband signal, but I think that's a little misleading. I think you really have to compare it to the data rate because we'll see later on in many of these systems there really is no unspread uh, baseband signal. The, the modulation and the coding and the spreading are really all sorted together so you can't really distinguish between them. So I like to define the process gain as simply equal to the RF bandwidth divided by the actual user data rate, whatever that may be. And in order to make this work, especially in a terrestrial system like a cellular telephone system where you have um, some links that are very short, some links that are very long, you really need some form of power control uh, to get around this problem. Um, if, you, if you have a, a bunch of mobiles that are all transmitting to one base station, some are very close to the base station, some are very far away, 
the way to solve this problem is to get all the mobile to adjust their power so that they all arrive at the base station with the same amount or equal amount of power. Then, then it will, then the system will work. This is, this is crucial to making a, a cellular telephone system work with CDMA. Okay, so now we come to the traditional block diagram you've probably seen if you've ever looked in a you know, book on spread spectrum. It's, it's shown as three separate modules on the transmit side here at the top. You see forward air correction coatings on here, followed by modulation, followed by spreading, and then you get your spread signal either IF or RF, and then you go out on the channel. At the receiver, you do these steps in reverse order. You despread the signal to modulate it and then decode it, which are simply the inverse steps of the, of the transmitter. In a military system or a secure system, you would have a fourth block. You'd have an encryptor here and a decryptor out here. But since we're hands, we'll, we'll drop that particular block off the diagram. Okay, this is, a, this is a traditional view of spread spectrum, and one of the things I want to point out later, as we get into this later on is that with more modern systems are tending to blur the distinction between these building blocks. And this is the way, you know, the classic way you learn about spread spectrum is these three building blocks that are, that are they're completely separate, but in, in real systems now, many of these elements are starting to, you know, do multiple functions. And you really have to combine the coding, the modulation, the spreading to, to one integrated piece. Okay. Uh, I mentioned port air correction coding. Um, I did a whole uh, tutorial on this at the Tapper uh, meeting in St. Louis. Um, I'm, I have that presentation with me here if we have to go into it to answer any questions. But I'm going to assume that most of you were probably at that seminar or seen it on the web and know a little bit about port air correction coding. But if that's not the case, please stop me and you know, ask questions if there's something you, you don't understand. Because I'm going to assume that you know something about what port air correction coding is and what it can do. Excellent. Okay, but this is a very brief review. There are two major categories or classes of, of codes for air correction codes, convolutional and block coding. Uh, the convolutional code's main advantage is that it can be used in a soft decision mode where you have quality indications on each received bit coming out of the modulator that improve the ability of the decoder to, to make a decision. Uh, it's just, the convolutional codes are usually today decoded with the Viterbi algorithm. There are others, but this is, this is the most popular. You can, you can do it in software. You can do it in hardware. There are chips available to do it at multi-megabit rates. Uh, one disadvantage of convolutional coding is that it's not very good at doing the first errors. If you want to uh, use a convolutional code on a channel that tends to give you burst errors, you have to interleave it as you have to, to, to after you run the, the, the data through the coder, you have to spread it out in time by, by basically slicing and dicing in time, send, so you're sending the decoded symbols over the channel in a different order than they were generated by the decoder so that any error burst should have broken up into lots of widely dispersed um, single bit errors which the decoder can, can handle. The other major category of, of, of forward error correction codes are block codes. The best known example is the reed solomon code, which is uh, uh, sort of very complementary to convolutional code and that it's very good at burst error correction. So you often find it some channels where the, the errors are currently bursty. There are other examples of block codes, such as the Hamming code, which is used on the GPS navigation message, uh, Golay, which is uh, uh, used in um, at least one amateur HF modem, and many, many others. There are enormous um, enormous family of block codes here, but these are probably the most important. Okay. Uh, examples of modulation you commonly use with spread spectrum systems. Uh, coherent PSK is very popular, especially with the direct sequence systems I'll talk about later. Uh, it's used, for example, in, in GPS. Uh, differentially coherent PSK is, is also fairly popular. Now, now the, the difference between these two is uh, really in the, the modulator. Uh, in a coherent PSK modulator, you're simply taking a, a, an RF carrier at some frequency and then phase modulating at 0, 180 or 0, 90, 180, and 70 degrees with a data sequence. And then the receiver has to recover the carrier component and reinject it and, and, and undo the, the modulation process. Uh, this can take time to do. If you, if you don't have a lot of time to acquire the carrier for transmission to be very short, you may spend most of your time in the packet trying to recover carrier and very little time to recover data. So there are, there are uh, simpler schemes to demodulate PSK which do not actually require that you recover the carrier in an explicit step. You can do it by comparing one symbol to the next. For example, if you are only looking for changes in phase and you're going from say 0 to 180 degrees, you can do that by simply comparing adjacent symbols. You don't actually have to require, uh, require a clock or a, excuse me, a um, carrier in order to do that. And this is very popular in some uh, faster uh, spread spectrum systems where you simply don't have enough time to, to, to acquire a carrier. Uh, other modulation schemes that are popular with uh, spread spectrum systems include uh, in orthogonal schemes, 
uh, such as memory FSK. We heard yesterday a, a paper on the use of 16 memory FSK with HF communications. Um, Minary FSK is, of course, just a special case of this. M is, can, it can be any number you want as long as it's the power of 2. Uh, so 2 area FSK is, is a perfectly acceptable form of, of, uh, of FSK, and that's just binary FSK with two tones. Uh, 4 area FSK would be FSK with four tones and so forth. Uh, Walsh coded PSK is one that we use in Qualcomm CDMA on the reverse channel. That is the channel that goes from the, the mobile user to the base station. Uh, and it can, in fact, be seen as a block code something that you'll see increasingly as we go on is that, you know, you, you can't really distinguish any work between coding and spreading and, and very often, and the modulation very often, these, these things can be seen as special cases of each other. Um, non orthogonal modulation modes are not generally used with spread spectrum. The reason being, like telescope modulation, for example, the reason being that these the modes are really designed for band-limited channels. Uh, the best example is a telephone modem, which uses very, very high order uh, telescope modulation to cram say 28.8 kilobits per second into a 3 kilohertz voice channel. Okay. The, there's, a, there's a price you pay for that. The price you pay for being able to cram that many bits into that few hertz is that you require a very high signal noise ratio. Well, in spread spectrum, we have exactly the opposite situation. We have lots of spectrum, but a very low signal noise ratio. So it doesn't really make sense to use these schemes in a, in a spread spectrum system. So you generally stay with these simple uh, orthogonal modes either, or, or antipodal modes like DSK which do not require very much energy per bit. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's correct. Yeah, we, yeah, I'm getting to the I mean, spread spectrum code thing. Okay. Yeah, and also you need simple timing also to, to recover uh, any of these keys. That's right. Yeah, coherent systems are not critically good for, for paths that fade. Particularly if you have, a, say, for example, a two-path uh, HF signal where, one, where, where the two paths are almost equal in strength and one's getting a little bit stronger than the other and then the other one gets a little stronger. When they are equal, of course, they, can't, they usually cancel, Murphy's Law being what it is. They usually add out of phase. So what you have, if you look at the response to that channel, what you have is, a, is, a, is an envelope that is you know, fluctuating up and down. And worse, the phase is reversing every time you go through one of those phases. Okay? This tends to really screw up any coherent uh, carrier recovery scheme, which is why coherent PSK is... is I don't think it's ever used on HF. It works fine on satellites where you don't have that kind of fading channel. But in any kind of, of fading channel where the phase is, is, a, is randomly perturbed by the channel, you really want to stay away from coherent schemes. And the differentially coherent schemes or the, or the MR orthogonal schemes are, are much more appropriate for those channels. Even though in theory they don't perform as well, on a fading channel they perform much better. Okay, now we talked about the different forms of spreading, the third block in the, in the block diagram. Uh, most of you have probably heard of direct sequence and frequency copying. There are other, other there are other ways of, of doing spreading that aren't very as popular. I won't be talking about them in, in much detail, such as time hopping. There are also hybrid combinations, which are, are actually surprisingly popular uh, combinations of, of direct sequence and frequency copying. They give you some of the, the attributes of both. And I'll show later on when we we talk about frequency hopping versus direct sequence. You know how you might like to be able to get the best properties of both. Direct sequence uh, spread spectrum, you have a mixer, which is nothing more than a multiplier mathematically. Uh, you would implement an analog as a double balance mixer, four quantum multiplier, what have you. Uh, and I've shown here, uh, rather than showing two separate uh, uh, mixers and PN generators, what I've shown here is just one with double arrows to show that this is a reversible process. I can take a baseband signal here, SFT, run it to this mixer, multiply it by a PN uh, sequence, P of T and end up with some spread signal, which is simply the product of these two. And I can reverse the process. I can take the spread signal multiplied again by the PN generator sequence, as long as it's in the proper phase, and recover the narrowband signal over here. Okay, so this is a reversible process. The process gain of this system is simply equal to the ratio of these two bandwidths. If I look at the bandwidth of the spread signal divided by the bandwidth of the baseband signal, that gives me some ratio. That ratio is the process gain either represent it as a ratio, like 100 to 1 or what have you, or as a, as a, as a decibel figure 20, 20 dB. The assumption is usually made that this bandwidth, the chipping rate here, is much higher than the, the, the baseband bandwidth. Okay. In other words, the process gain is, is a large number. Is there a question? Okay. Frequency hopping, there's an extra uh, block here. Uh, again, we have a mixer that's converting a baseband signal up to some spread signal, but instead of multiplying 
the baseband signal directly by the PN generator, there is a uh, frequency synthesizer in, in the pattern. So the PN generator, instead of directly multiplying the, the input signal and producing a direct sequence signal, is instead causing a frequency synthesizer to hop around in frequency. Okay. Then that uh, carrier, that instantaneous uh, carrier, is multiplied by the baseband signal to produce the, the spread signal. There are a couple parameters here uh, that you didn't have in the direct sequence case. For example, there's A, which is the amplitude of the of the PN generator, uh, of the, of the amplitude of the, the frequency deviation on the synthesizer. So one of the parameters you have to specify for a, a, a frequency hop system is the range over which you're hopping, as well as the rate at which you're hopping. So there's several more parameters to define a, a, a frequency hop system. Again, uh, it, it, at the receiver, you can simply reverse the process by feeding the signal in from the right. As long as the PN generators are synchronized, the, the synthesizers will follow the same sequence of carrier frequencies, and you'll end up with the original baseband signal. Greater than yeah, that, that should yeah, that's carried through. That that assumption is also made here that the bandwidth is, is, is much is the, the hopping range over which you're hopping is much greater in instantaneous bandwidth of the, of the signal for you to get meaningful processing. Ah, okay. Is, yes or no? Okay. This this uh, whether it is or not depends on whether it's a fast or slow hop system. Okay, and I'll get to that later. You can, you can, not only can you control in a frequency hop system the range over which you're hopping, that is the frequency range, you can also control the rate at which you're hopping. That rate can either be very fast compared to the data rate or it can be very slow. So one's called fast hopping and one's called slow hopping. Yeah? Okay. Stream of bits, which are called chips. The continuous non-ending stream that typically repeats, but it can have a very long interval before it repeats. That's good. Here's a typical generator, and I probably won't get the taps right because I don't know primitive polynomials off the tip of my tongue here, but let's, let's assume that this one is, is in fact primitive. I take some collection of taps, okay, and then I feed them back in the, in the shift register, and the shift register shifts in this direction. Okay? And I take my output, let's say, from here. Okay. And let's assume I pick these taps correctly. Okay. And I'm not going to say that this is. Okay. You have to look, them up, look up the taps in the textbook to find out the right ones. And let's say this register is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 stages long. Okay. So L is equal to 6. Okay. If, this, if I choose these taps correctly, what this will generate is a sequence, a binary sequence, okay, that will appear random, but it will repeat every 2 to the 6 minus 1 chips. Okay. So you see, because the, the, the register goes through all possible combinations of bits before it repeats, except for the all zero state, which is the disallowed state. I can make these sequences very, very long before they repeat. Okay. GPS uses a sequence that's 2 to the 10 minus 1 chips, which is 1023. Okay. But because it sends them at, at 1.023 million chips per second, it repeats every millisecond. Okay. On the other hand, the P code that's used, that's the clear access code in GPS, the P code uh, uses a much, much longer sequence that, in fact, doesn't even repeat before they reset it. Okay? And even though they're using it ten times the rate. Yeah, except they repeat it every, I think they reset every week or... Okay. Yeah. So you can make you can make these codes extremely long before they repeat. And they're very easy to do because all you have to do is make the ship register longer and, and pick the tasks appropriately. You can generate these, these sequences that look like random bits, but they do repeat. And they're very easy to generate. Mm-hmm. Okay. If you just simply take this output and you feed it into a mixer, which is a multiplier, here's the PN generator I just drew right here, and I have a baseband signal, and we'll assume this is also digital, okay, so it's either plus one or, or, or negative one. And these signals, by the way, are also level converted to negative one or plus one. Okay, and then what comes out, there's a sequence of plus and minus ones, which are the two of these multiplied together. Okay. In 
digital signal processing, uh, you generally use you know minus plus one, and, and digital logic is zero and one. But I mean, it's, 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 it's how, how you represent it. Okay, this could be an exclusive OR gate if you're using digital logic levels. But if you're using uh, bipolar uh, numbers, then it's multiplication, modulo two multiplication, or excuse me, addition. Yes, in frequency hopping, that's right. In frequency hopping, let's say you you have 64 possible channels that you can hop over, and okay, then you would group. One way to do it, and there are many ways of doing it. One way to do it would be to take a group of six bits, okay, two to the six and 64. Right? Okay, you can take this, take them in that in, in that order, and then and then have that determine your hopping. There's, there's many ways of doing it. Another way to do it is just to have a table and just step around the table with a counter. Okay. There's many ways of doing it. The important thing is the two end degree on what you're doing. That's, that's, that's really basic. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to be uh, able to modulate the signal. Does that answer your question? I think so. Let me ask one follow-up. Okay. So, in direct Well, it's inherently spread across the frequency because this thing is being clocked at a much higher rate than the signal coming in. Let's say this is coming in, let's say, one kilobit per second. Let's say we're clocking this, this, this shift, shift register at one megabit per second. Okay, the output will be at one megabit per second. Okay. So let's say that the, let's say the input bit for at a given instant is say plus one. Okay, and it will stay that way one second for one kilohertz. Okay. What I will then get at the output will be the PN generator will be fed directly to the output for one millisecond. So I'll see whatever these are will show up on the output whole millisecond. Let's say the next bit is a negative one. Now I will get a millisecond's worth or a thousand of these PN chips all at once. Okay. But the bandwidth is controlled by the larger of the two input bandwidths. In this case, the PN generator is being clocked at a megabit, while the data is only being clocked at a kilobit, so the output will be at a megabit. Okay, and it'll be that wide. Yeah, it's yeah, you can you can do it either way. Whatever your convention is, either you multiply plus one and negative one, or you modulo to add with an exclusive word gate zero and one. I mean, it's the end result. The math is the same. The result is the same. Right? Because if you, if you, if you just do a very simple um, truth table here, you know, minus one plus one. Okay, and you combine this with minus one plus one. What do you get? You get plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one. Okay. Excuse me. Okay. Okay. And if you do exclusive OR logic with digital levels, say zero and one, okay, with the exclusive OR truth table, you get zero, zero, one, one. Okay. So you can map zero and one to negative one and plus one. The, the results are the same. Okay. So that's uh, that's uh, frequency hopping. Uh, I mentioned earlier there's a synchronization problem. This comes about because the, 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 the sequences we're using are, are, are semi-orthogonal or mostly orthogonal with time-shifted versions of themselves. We don't have this problem in narrowband receivers because sine waves are not orthogonal with time-shifted versions themselves. So I don't have to worry about the timing of the signal. Okay? So there's a price you pay here for the ability to discriminate um, signals that are arriving with different delays, which is that I have to determine what that delay is, and I have to track it. So uh, a spread spectrum receiver that has a, um, well, in fact, any spread spectrum receiver, regardless of whether it's slow or fast, has to uh, acquire code phase at whatever rate the um, hopping sequence or spreading sequence is, is, is going. Okay? That is, I have to determine not only uh, not only do I know the sequence, I have to know the sequence in time, at, you know, when does it start at a particular moment in order to be able to recover it. I have to, in a frequency hop system, I have to synchronize the, the, uh, the hopping of the receiver with the hopping of the generator at the, at the transmitter. And in the uh, direct sequence system, I have to make sure my PN generator is synchronized with the PN generator of the sender, plus the propagation delay over the, over the channel, whatever that may be. Okay. Uh, if you're not careful, uh, this can create a very large problem. Okay. This has to be designed very carefully. If you pick, uh, let's say, a uh, shift register that has 47 stages in it, okay, you just sort of pick some random starting point in the shift register, and you start transmitting. And the receiver now has to figure out where in the search space you are, okay, and assuming he's not close enough actually to modulate each individual chip because he's well down below the noise floor. I mean, you could spend, you know, the rest of the life of the universe trying to find this signal, okay. So you have to be very careful in the design of these systems so that you don't make the search space too impractically large, okay. 
because not only do you have to require, uh, acquire code phase, you also have to acquire these other things you already have to acquire in conventional narrowband digital systems, such as uh, symbol timing, uh, carrier frequency, and phase, if, if it's appropriate, if it's applicable, if you're doing a coherent modulator. And this can create a multi-dimensional search space because if, if, you, you, if you're searching for uh, code phase and carrier frequency at the same time, you have, to, you have to go through several dimensions. You have to try all possible combinations to find the right one unless the signal is extremely strong, which we can't assume. So uh, most systems uh, try to break this down and do a search one dimension at a time. Uh, you have to acquire code phase first and let the signal is, is way above the noise floor, which again, you can't assume. So you have to first look for code phase. In some systems, such as direct sequence systems or fast uh, frequency hop systems, symbol timing is usually locked to the code timing in some predefined way. So once you've found the code timing, the symbol timing just falls out. You don't have to, you can skip that step as you normally have to do in a dimensional um, narrowband uh, digital modem. Um, once you've found code phase, you can now despread the signal and have it pop up above the noise floor. Now you can go ahead and, and acquire carrier frequency and carrier phase if necessary, depending on the modulation method that you're, that you're using. Uh, these can be done the conventional way using a, a frequency tracking loop for a differential demodulator or a constant loop, what have you, for a, uh, for a system that requires a carrier phase. And again, if the symbol timing is not a, a function of the code phase, then you also have to acquire the, the, the symbol timing. This is, a, this is the case in slow frequency cop systems where the, the two are not necessarily related. So uh, the way you generally do it is by brute force. Okay? You step through all possible code offsets uh, in the, uh, for example, a direct sequence system, looking for energy to suddenly pop up at the output of the, the spreader. If, you're, if you have the wrong code phase, you're going to get an output which is just as spread as the input. In fact, you're spreading it twice. Okay? So the output will be a very wide band, very thin signal, very low uh, power density. If you suddenly find the right offset, what will happen is the original unspread signal will pop up in the output of the spreader, and, that, and that's what you're looking for. So you put a, a filter around where you expect that to be, you block through all possible code offsets until suddenly you get energy in that filter. Okay. And you try all try all offsets to do that, and to make this practical, you try to keep the sequence short so it repeats over a reasonable period of time, so you can actually try all possible offsets in a reasonable period of time. In order for this to work, the filter that follows the, the spreader has to be wide enough to accept the maximum uh, uncertainty in the carrier frequency of the signal. Okay. You may have uh, uh, a spread signal that's, say, a megahertz wide, but if your post is spreading filters a kilohertz wide, then the original carrier has to be somewhere within that one kilohertz bandwidth or else you won't find it. It'll pop out. When, when you spread, when you find the correct code phase, the spread signal will be outside that filter, so you'll miss it. Okay. So you've got to make sure that filter is either wide enough to accommodate the, um, the, the, the maximum frequency uncertainty of the received signal, or if you don't have enough signal noise ratio to do that, you have to step that across in frequency, and that creates a two-dimensional search problem. You now have to search through code phase in one dimension and frequency in another dimension. And you have really no choice to, uh, but to do that if the signal noise ratio is, is too low and the Doppler shift is, is too high. This is the case for GPS receivers when they come up from a cold start. The antennas are too small to be able to detect uh, a carrier, a uh, spray carrier in such a wide bandwidth, the bandwidth that, that corresponds to the frequency uncertainty of of the uh, received uh, carrier when you don't know its offer shift ahead of time. So the rate at which you can do this depends on the signal noise ratio. Uh, you, the longer you're willing to dwell at each possible point in the search space, the longer you can, you can accumulate energy and the more reliable reading you'll get of whether or not there's a signal there. Okay, so if you have a very strong signal, you can search very rapidly. If you have a weak signal, you have to dwell a long time at each one of these search points in order to find the energy. So if you look at the output of the correlator, that is the, the PN generator run through, the, the PN um, C spreader run through the, uh, the filter, and then you just look at the energy coming out of that. You, you run it through an envelope detector, an AM detector, what have you, and you put the output on, a, on the graph, and then you vary the code offset back and forth. It gets something that looks a lot like this. You know, I drew this by hand, uh, so this is not quite symmetrical. It should be a symmetrical peak here. But what you'll see on either side, if you're more than one chip off, you'll see just noise, just garbage. Even if there's no noise in the channel, you'll see some stuff here because you're going to get some uh, effect of the signal coming through the, the spreader, but it'll be low and it'll be random. Okay? In fact, the longer you, you're willing to integrate, the, 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 lower, the lower this noise will be. You'll, you'll crush this farther down into the, into the baseline, and the higher the main peak will be. When you're within one chip, you'll get this strong peak, which is called a correlation peak. Okay? And if you're right on time, it'll be maximum. If you're uh, half a chip 
off either direction, you'll be down somewhere on this on this slope. Okay, so one way to uh, one way, and we'll see in the next couple of slides. One way to track these signals is by looking for the, 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 the top of this peak and trying to ride the ride the curve up to the top. Yeah. Excuse me. Well, if you're searching the signal and you don't know where it is, you have no choice but to try all possible chip offsets. But when you find the proper offset, okay, this is what will happen. When you're within one chip, you'll get this big spike coming out of the car layer. Okay, now, if you can imagine, one way to do this would be a very nice demonstration would be to take a PN generator driving a balanced mixer, put into a, the output of a transmitter, run it over the air, and have a copy of it at another uh, narrowband receiver and tune to the proper frequency and then adjust the PN timing. If you were to do that, you would hear nothing but noise until you're within one chip, and then suddenly a carrier would pop up. You would actually hear it in the middle of the pass band. And the strength of that carrier would depend on how far off you are from being dead on at proper timing. So if you're more than one chip off, all you would hear is noise. As soon as you get within one chip either side, you would hear a, a carrier come up, and as you, as you tune closer to the center of the timing, the, 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 the estimator would peak. Okay. This is effectively what the searcher is doing automatically. It's basically tuning back and forth until it maximizes the estimator. Okay. This is something hands understand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the ratio to, of it to the stuff on the side will, yes. But again, here the process gain is a function of how long you integrate because we're looking right now just for a, a spread carrier with no data on it. So it, we can integrate as long as we want. Okay, we're, we're acquiring a signal here. We haven't yet begun to send, send data. Or we are using a system where we have what's called a pilot with no data. Okay, so the signal wedge ratio here is a function of the process gain and how long you integrate, which is really the same thing. That's right, or, or, or finer. It's one way of looking at it, yeah. Now, when you're tracking, of course, you want to track much more accurately than half a chip. But for course acquisition, yeah, you can step, you step through this in, in half chip increments until, until you see some energy and you zero in and, and do a fine adjustment. Uh, so I said that earlier on you had to be careful on how you design these systems. If you just take a long sequence and you don't synchronize it to anything ahead of time, like GPS time, for example, then you can spend you know, infinity looking for this signal. So there are many real systems that actually use multiple spreading codes. They use a short code, that is a code that repeats rel after relatively few chips to make it easy to find. And then you use that to bootstrap yourself onto tracking a much longer code that may not repeat at all or uh, in the lifetime of the, of the equipment, uh, depending on how it's designed. So. Most of these systems have some reference component, that is some piece of the signal that is spread only by the short code. And, then, and the first thing you do when you turn the receiver on is to look for that component. And then once you've got that, now you've got timing to some accuracy. Now you know, now you can go ahead and look for the, the long component, or the one that, that doesn't repeat as often. Okay. Uh, examples of this are found both in IS95 CDMA digital cellular and in GPS. In, in IS95 CDMA, there's a 2 to the 15 chip short code that repeats uh, um, quite a few times per second because the chipping rate is, is about one, one and a quarter megahertz. Uh, but there's also a long code of the length 2 to the 42 minus 1, which is obviously a very long sequence. Uh, both are uh, chipped at exactly the same rate, but there's a pilot component that is a, a piece of the carrier that has nothing other, no other modulation on it that is chipped only by the short code. The first thing that happens when you turn the phone on is it goes through all possible offsets, which are 32, 768 um, possible offsets of the 2 to the 15 chip short code looking for a correlation peak. Okay. And when it finds that, it turns off a little no service light, a little red light goes off on the phone, and now the phone has timing. And now it can bootstrap itself up through a process of looking at other channels on this on this signal to find out how to require the long code, which is actually done when, when you go into a call. Uh, GPS is a very similar technique. The codes are different, but the principle is the same. GPS uses the uh, uses the 2 to the 10th chip code, uh, which is very short, repeats every millisecond. Um, and that's on what's called the CA channel. I've seen CA referred to either as course acquisition or clear access. I guess I have a couple of different course acquisition. Yeah. The original idea was that the CA channel code would only be used to get you approximate timing because so you didn't go ahead and acquire the P code. Now, the civilian receivers, most of them stopped after they got the CA code. Okay. But the original idea of the CA code was a bootstrap to get you onto tracking the P code, which runs at a higher chip rate, 10.23 megachips per second, 10 times the rate and it's much, much longer.
but it's only but each satellite is only using a one week piece of it, and it resets or changes after a week, which is why it says a week long code. How long? 37? Happy? <laughs> I love PowerPoint. It's great. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. Once you've found the proper code phase, you know how to keep tracking it. Okay, it doesn't help to just find it once. You want to, you want to stay on it. Uh, to do this, time tracking loops that are actually very similar to phase lock loops that you're already familiar with for tracking uh, carriers are used. And they exist in several forms, but they all basically work on the same principle by comparing early and late versions of the, of the uh, reference signal against the incoming signal. Now, here's an example of what's called a parallel tracking loop. Here we actually have three separate correlators. One, two, three, all fed by the same signal. We have a TN generator that instead of generating just one output, actually generates three copies of the output. But this one is a half shift early, and this one's a half shift late, and this one's considered to be on time. Okay. And they're controlled by a common input source here, which is a, you know, basically a voltage controlled oscillator. So the way this, this, this filter, the way this, this loop works, is if you're on time, okay, Let's, let's, just say, let's assume we're on time because he's already gone through the signal and we've, we've searched for it and we're, we're tracking it. The on time uh, component will be used to display the signal and actually produce the data that is used later on. Okay, so this is the output of this, of this loop. This is the data output. Okay. The half shift early and half shift late signals will be straddling that correlation peak that I showed earlier and hopefully they should provide exactly the same output because that peak should be symmetrical. Okay. So the, the energy in, in the early and the late channels are compared is you compute the energy by squaring it, which is basically an AM detector. And then you compare these two. As long as they're the same, the TN generator is allowed to run the way it's going. If one of them starts to become a little bit higher than the other, which means you're starting to slide off that peak, either the, the early or the late channel will have more energy in it because you'll be sliding off the peak. It'll no longer be symmetrically centered in the, in the, uh, in the window. And the output of this op amp here will uh, steer the TN generator in the correct direction. Right. You see how this works. It's just like a phase lock loop, except for tracking time rather than the phase. Uh, yes, excuse me. There should be a loop filter here. No, I'm not going to draw it now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now that one used a lot of logic. So it had a lot of hardware. It had three separate mixers and, and quite a bit of logic. It's it's fast. It has to be managed to be fast and and, and work well, but. You can sometimes use uh, simplified versions where you take the, the, the hardware, you basically timeshare it between the, uh, the three channels, the early, late, and, and phase channel. And this is, uh, this, here's an example of a loop that does that. It's called a tall dither tracking loop. Here we, again, we have a mixer and a PN generator driven by a VCO. Here I've separated the VCO and the PN generator into two separate blocks. Uh, and we have uh, a bandhead filter, which is looking at the despread signal. The output is sent out here. And we have, uh, again, the energy detector here. But we also have this block called a dither generator, which basically drives the VCO. It just, it, it just dithers it back and forth around the peak and then uh, corrects the sign of the energy coming out here, uh, depending on the phase of the dither generator, and then filters the uh, resulting um, error signal and sends it back to the VCO. So as long as you're on phase, you'll be dithering exactly plus or minus one half chip around the center of the peak. The, the, the two uh, energies should be the same at that point. The output from this, uh, uh, from the, uh, the difference here will be zero, and the VCO will continue to run um, as it's going. If the, if the VCO starts to drift off to one side, then again, uh, one, uh, the, the uh, energy when you go off on, uh, the, uh, on one of the half chip offsets will either be greater or less than on the other side. You'll now get a different signal here, which will be filtered into a DC uh, correction voltage which will then drive the, the VCO back onto the correct phase. Yeah. That's right. That's right. These will not work if you um, simply put them on the signal without knowing where it is. Unless, of course, you have some sleeping circuits that will sweep the VCO all the way through the range. Now, again, this is very analogous to the way a phase lap loop works. Okay, If you're way, way off in frequency in a phase lap loop, if you're not careful, it won't lock at all. Okay, So you very often need sleeping 
circuits that will sweep the phase and frequency of the, of the loop around to get it close enough that it can lock on its own. Here it's harder because if you've got a, a, uh, a correlation uh, function that looks like uh, the one I showed earlier, okay, there's nothing out here. There's nothing, there's nothing to give you an error voltage to drive you in the right direction. So you have no choice but to sweep all the way through this, the rest of the space until you find this peak. Once you find the peak, you can, you can, you know, you can climb onto it and, and, and track it. This is a little bit different from a phase lock loop with a, with a, uh, when you're tracking a sine wave because there you usually have um, uh, error voltages that are like pieces of a sinusoid. Okay? And even if you're way off, you see the, the, the error voltage will drive you in the correct direction back to the center. I guess the analogous case here is if you're so far off in frequency, you get nothing at all out of the loop. That would be an analogous case to here, where if you're so far off the correct time, you get nothing. You have no choice but to force the, the loop to go through all possible offsets until you find the right one. Okay, now this loop has the advantage of being very simple. In fact, uh, Tom Clark and I have talked about using this exact scheme for a ranging method for the Phase 3D satellite that's ever launched, where we could uh, do and ranging through the transponder for, for tracking purposes, orbit determination purposes. Uh, the, the nice, uh, uh, way, the nice uh, uh, thing about this approach is that this part right here can be a standard amateur transceiver. Okay? This is really what an amateur transceiver is. It mixes your signal down to baseband, runs it through a filter, and then gives you an output. So we could actually build this system using external hardware around an unmodified transceiver. We would put the mixer, in this case the PN generator, would be on, front, on the front of the, uh, the, the receiver driven by an external VCO and, and, and PN generator. The audio output could be run through a, uh, um, a sound card, uh, an algorithm done in, in DSP, or it could be done in, in analog, that would simply look at the energy being received and then steer the loop in the right direction. Okay? The advantage of the tau dinner loop in this case is we only need one receiver rather than three. Okay? We would need to do the parallel loop, we would have to have three separate receivers all be fed to the same signal. Uh, this one allows us to do with just one. The disadvantage of this loop is because the, the, the loop is, it spends so much time off the correct time, you lose signal noise ratio. Okay, so the price, the price you pay for the simplicity here in the hardware is you lose, you lose um, a bit in signal noise ratio. But if you've got plenty of signal noise ratio, then it may be a worthwhile trade-off. Okay, so I, I, said, I said earlier that in designing a spread spectrum system, the coding, the modulation, the spreading really have to be matched. There are some combinations here that really don't make a whole lot of sense. Okay. To give you a good example, if you try to do a coherent TSK in a frequency hop system where the hop rate was so fast that you hop every symbol, let's say, okay, you would never, it would never work because the coherent demodulator would never have a stable phase reference to, to track. Okay. So there are certain combinations of coding, modulation, spreading that don't make sense in spread spectrum. You really have to put them together as an integrated system. Yeah. No, no. You can you can track to less than a, than a chip. I mean, we do this at GPS all the time. Okay, the, the chipping grade on GPS is about a megahertz. Okay, so you would think, well, if, if I can only get accuracies on an order of a chip, what's what's how much how far does light propagate in a microsecond? It's about 300 meters. Okay, we know you can, we know we can do better than that. Okay, because we can track to less than a chip. This is a phase lock loop. Can track to much less than than a, than a complete cycle. All right. It's a function of the signal noise ratio. The better the signal noise ratio. The, the less jitter there will be in the loop, and the more accuracy we can get out of it. Yeah. It, the reason is is that if I look at this uh, correlation um, function here, the, the, the tau dinner loop spending all its time either you know half it's spending all its time half chip off, either here or here. It's not it's not spending much time up at the top, so it's losing energy. Okay. But the parallel loop. The, I have a, um, uh, a, a special channel which is used nothing, to do nothing but to modulate the signal with the best estimate of the code phase that I have at the time. Okay, so when you design these systems, you really have to mod to match all these parameters. Uh, certain combinations don't make sense. And in fact, uh, you can really see many of these uh, features, uh, the features of one particular block in the system as, as being very much like the others. Okay? So you can't really distinguish coding, modulation, and spreading anymore. They really start looking a lot like each other. And the newer systems really tend to blur the distinction here. Uh, for example, you can almost think of forward error correction as a form of spreading because after all, it adds redundancy to the signal. It's making the signal wider. If I have a rate one-half convolutional code, 
that means I'm, if I'm putting in a, 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 a data of a stream at one kilobit per second, what's coming out is two kilobits per second. Okay, that's almost like spreading. You know, I'm making it wider. I'm making it twice as wide. Uh, in fact, uh, Andy Viterbi uh, published a paper uh, some years back showing how you could do spreading just with convolutional coding. He came up with a family of very low rate convolutional code, say rate 100, 1 over 128, for example, where for every data bit that goes in, you get 128 code symbols out. Well, that ratio is large enough to be you know, considered a true spreading system. That would have a processing of, of, of over 10 to 1, or of over 10 dB, excuse me. Uh, in fact, it would be uh, about 11 dB. All right, so, so you can really see the coding is a form of spread spectrum, or spread spectrum is a form of coding, what have you. Okay, they're really not distinct anymore. Uh, I mentioned multiple, uh, or uh, MRE modulation, for example, MRE FSK with, that's FSK with multiple tones. You can see that as a form of block coding. Uh, each tone is orthogonal to all the other tones. Uh, so you can see that as a form of a block code. In fact, there were some of the early codes that were used. I think they were used on uh, some of the early um, Mariner missions to Mars before uh, convolutional coding became uh, the accepted practice. They would use this MRE orthogonal modulation. And it actually cut down the required to noise ratio by quite a bit. Uh, you can also think of this as a form of spreading because if you use a very large value of M, the, output, the resulting channel bandwidth is going to be very large compared to the input data rate. Uh, for example, if I'm uh, using 256 area modulation as the 256 possible carriers, and I spread them out as I have to in order to keep them from interfering with each other, um, I'm, I'm increasing my bandwidth here on the order of something like 256 over 8, you know, 2 to the 8 being 256. That's quite a ratio. I mean, that's, that's again, large enough to be considered a form of spreading. Even BPSK can be thought of as a spreading scheme that doubles the bandwidth of the signal that goes into it. You consider QPSK to be your baseline uh, modulation scheme, and BPSK is, is essentially a form of spreading where you double the, the necessary bandwidth. And in fact, you do get some process gain out of it. You, you were able to reject uh, interfering signals that are in quadrature with the, with the, uh, the phase of the carrier that's carrying the BPSK signal. In a sense, yeah. Yeah. Okay, now I said to talk a little bit about direct sequence versus frequency hopping, and we need to first talk about some of the properties of each one. Um, direct sequence, if you look at it on the spectrum analyzer, looks an awful lot like high-speed PSK, which is in fact exactly what it is. You know, most of those PSK bits are in fact pseudo-random bits coming out of a PN generator, but what we have there is a PSK modulator. Okay, it can either be a, a BPSK modulator or a QPSK modulator. What I showed was the, the BPSK version, but you know, there are quite other forms. That, spread with QPSK if you wish. And in fact, it can be band limited just like PSK, so you don't have to put out with all these slide loads that go off there for, forever that you, we get with unfiltered PSK with a square wave uh, modulating signal. Uh, one of the important properties of direct sequence is that it maintains the phase coherence of the signal through each chip. Okay, so I can chip at a very high rate, say a megahertz or so, but I can still run modulation methods that require phase coherence over much longer periods of time than that. It's a very important property of direct sequence that frequency hopping does not have. Okay. This makes it very useful for ranging and tracking, because if I'm ranging and tracking, I generally want to have a coherent signal. First of all, I want to be able to ship at a very high rate so I can get good um, range resolution. I also like to be able to detect that signal coherently so I can do carrier phase estimation to get really good uh, accuracy. So direct sequence is especially useful when you want to do ranging and tracking. In fact, that's why GPS uses it and why most satellite tracking, um, PN satellite tracking doesn't use direct sequence. Okay. Uh, to a narrow band signal, a uh, direct sequence signal looks like the use wide band noise, okay? and vice versa. If you put a narrow band signal in as interference to a, to a direct sequence system, it'll be spread by the same process that these spreads the desired signal, and it'll come out looking like wide band noise, of which the filter will see only a piece of it. So you see process gain both ways here. You see process gain uh, in, in, the, in the narrow band to wide band, and the wide band to narrow band interference uh, direction. Now, frequency hopping, on the other hand, looks a lot like MRE FSK, which is, in fact, what it is. Okay? Again, the modulation here is by a pseudorandom sequence rather than by real data. But if you're looking at this on the spectrum analyzer, you don't really necessarily know that. Okay? So you can think of frequency hopping as simply being a, a form of FSK with many tones driven by a pseudorandom sequence. Okay? Uh, but one difference, one very important difference between frequency hopping and direct sequence is that frequency hopping does not stay phase coherent through a hop. Even if you use the direct digital synthesizer, you know, with, with nice clean phase transitions, okay, uh, 
this would probably not be true because most real channels are dispersive. That is, they do not have a constant propagation delay as a function of frequency. This is especially true at HF. Okay. So you cannot assume when you design a frequency hop system that any carrier that you are using as baseband is going to stay coherent. You're going to have you're going to have a jump. You're going to have a phase jump every time the carrier hops a frequency. Okay. Um, and that's very important in, in the selection of the modulation method that's used with, with frequency hopping. Uh, a frequency hopper will look like an occasional strong interference to a, a co-channel narrowband signal as opposed to continuous low-level you know, wideband interference. It looks like an occasional strong uh, jammer and then nothing in between until it comes back to the same channel. And vice versa, uh, the, the, the spread signal, the hop signal, will not encounter any interference at all until it lands on a narrowband interferer and then it will see a very strong interferer for the, the duration of that hop and then it will go away when it, when it hops anywhere else. This is uh, very important when the, the select coding scheme Well, for any hopper, uh, any hopper is, is only going to see interference when it lands on uh, a channel with a narrowband interferer. Yeah? Unless, of course, you're using coding with enough interleaving to get around that and make it look If you use a code that, that can handle these bursts of errors that you get, Well, you, the two together give you give you process gain. Okay. I mean, well, you get process gain in, in any event. Okay, if you look at the average signal noise ratio coming out of the spreader, even without the coding. Now, that may not be good enough without the coding, right? It doesn't do you any good if 99% of your bits are good, if 1% are always bad, right? The average is not very good. But I can take, I can with poor air correction coding, I can take that average and make it as good as I want. Okay. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So um, let's, let's talk a little bit about you know, direct sequence versus frequency hopping, you know, which ones you pick for, for a given system design. Uh, well, it really depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to do tracking and ranging, then I, I think it's clear direct sequence is the way to go. Okay? And this is why it's chosen for all the satellite-based um, ranging and navigation systems I'm aware of, GPS and the, the tracking and data relay satellite system used by the space shuttle and other NASA spacecraft are both direct sequence systems because tracking and ranging are, are an inherent part of these, of these systems. The GPS, the data is transferred is a secondary thing. It's just you know, used to make this ranging work. With Hedris, it's both a communication and a tracking system, but because tracking is so important, they chose direct sequence. Uh, if you need very good multipath rejection, it seems like direct sequence is also the way to go because in order for a multipath to be rejected, you need to use the chip time that's very short compared to the, the delay spread on the channel. Multipath occurs when you have multiple paths between transmit and receiver. Uh, if one of those is the direct path, that'll be the one that arrives first. All the other paths will be delayed by, by the additional uh, propagation delay because the signal is going over a longer physical distance to reach it. In order for you to be able to reject the, or discriminate among these multipath components, you must use a chipping sequence that is faster than that delay spread. Okay? Now, in theory, you can do this with frequency hopping, but there are problems with doing that. Now, I'll get into the next slide. It turns out that uh, it's much easier to run very high chipping rates and to get this multipath discrimination if you use direct sequence. Okay. Uh, so I said fast frequency hopping may work, but there are other problems with it. Slow frequency hopping, this is important, slow frequency hopping has no inherent multipath rejection. Okay. If you go on a channel and you dwell on it for, say, a second, okay, all your multipath components are probably going to arrive within that second unless you're communicating to Mars. Okay. So you've got you've got to either do chipping at a very high rate with direct sequence or very, very fast frequency hopping if you're going to have any chance of discriminating across uh, <coughs> different multipath components. In a typical metropolitan area, the delay spreads we typically see are on the order of a few microseconds. So you have to chip faster than a few hundred kilohertz if you're going to take advantage of, of the ability here to discriminate against multipath. Uh, if, you're absolute, if you're after absolute maximum capacity of a channel, um, <laughs> This is a direct function of the required EB over N0. That's the digital signal noise ratio. Okay? Uh, this is why port error correction, which is the primary way you reduce the EB over N0 requirements by using coding, this is why it's so important. Power control is also vital because you don't want to actually use any more signal noise ratio than is absolutely required. So you want a system that requires the least, minimum signal, the least possible signal noise ratio of the function, and you want to keep the power down in practice so that you don't operate any higher than that, that threshold. You want to keep the signal noise ratio as low as possible. Uh, you can go through a lot of math and show that the capacity of a spread spectrum EDMA system where multiple 
users are sharing the same channel with different codes, is a direct function of the EBRN0. In fact, it's, 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 it's almost exact. If you double the required EBRN0, as you increase it by 3 dB, you've had the capacity of your system. Okay. Well, on the other hand, if you can come up with a better code that, re that reduces your e required EBRN0 by 3 dB, you've now just doubled the capacity of your system. In a commercial cellular telephone system, I mean, this directly translates into a lot of dollars. So there's a very strong pressure here in a commercial system to, in, to use the most efficient coding possible. And this is really um, most, uh, most easily done with direct sequence because, it, again, it provides uh, the ability to coherent PFK, at least on a satellite channel where you don't have fading. Uh, in the commercial CDMA systems we have, we send a pilot, which is used to provide a carrier reference, so we can still do a coherent demodulation, uh, even in a mobile environment. Um, now, you can do coherent PSK also on a slow hopper where you have plenty of time to recover carrier phase, uh, but you've, you've lost other things such as the ability to deal with multipath. Yeah, there's a question in the back. Yeah, uh, I, I, the, the versions you have was as of a couple days ago and last night I added a couple of uh, additional uh, slides to make some last minute changes. Yeah, I, I, all this will be off my webpage when, when I'm done when I get back to California. Uh, the website is my homepage, and um, well, I can put it up on a separate slide. Uh, it's also on the title slide of this talk. You go, yeah, it actually, actually, it's on the title slide of the talk, which you have in your handout. So just go to that page and look for Ham Radio Digital Communications, and it will be there. Okay, so uh, so if you're after maximum capacity, uh, direct sequence seems to be the way to go. Uh, on the other hand, you can use frequency hopping with a one of these high-value M airy FSK systems, which also gives pretty good performance, and you can get results that are almost as good. So on the capacity issue, I'm not sure you can really make a strong case for direct sequence. It seems to have a slight edge over, over frequency hopping, which is why it was chosen in, in, in cellular uh, CDMA. Uh, larger the better. Uh, in IS-95 CDMA on the reverse channel, where we do this, nine, this, this orthogonal signaling, we use M64. Okay. The higher the better. The problem, of course, is that eventually ran out of bandwidth. Even on the spread system, we ran out of bandwidth. Okay. Uh, now, if you're after uh, the absolute maximum resistance to jammers, narrowband jammers, either accidental jammers or intentional jammers, uh, this is something that's actually inherently easier to do with frequency hopping. Okay. If um, I hop around uh, a, a, a band with a small number of narrowband jammers, then only a fraction of my Hops are going to hit them, hope, okay. And I can use the burst error correcting code, such as the Reed-Solomon code, to code right through it. Okay. So as long as only a certain fraction of my hops are jammed, okay, then I can use coding to ride right through this, fill in the holes, and, and keep on going. A direct sequence system, on the other hand, when faced with an error band jammer anywhere within its pass band, will see that as continuous noise. And if the jammer happens to be strong, it will be knocked down by the processing, but if the jammer is strong, it may be so strong I can't demodulate anything at all. Okay, so a direct sequence system tends to be rather susceptible to narrowband jamming, especially strong narrowband jamming, while frequency hopping tends to be a little more robust to it. Yes? If, if, I, did, if I did direct sequence with quadrature mixing, okay, rather than, than, than uh, binary, okay, and I cooked the uh, spreading sequence that I fed into it, yes, I could turn into frequency hopping. Right? If I can take the signal, run it through a quadrature mixer, and if I put the right things into it, I can make it shift in frequency. Okay. So, yeah, and, and down somewhere in the bowels of the mathematics, like you probably show the frequency hopping correct sequence is sort of the same thing, right? But in practice, as a practical matter, okay, that's not the way it's done. In, in practical direct sequence systems, you use these pseudo-random sequences to modulate the signal so that it's everywhere all the time and within the passband. A frequency op system at any given instance is only one place. A direct sequence signal spread out continuously all the time over the whole channel. Right. Yeah, but I would be turning it into a frequency op system if I did that. Okay. I mean, there are other ways of dealing with narrowband jammers. Okay, in a direct sequence system, I can put in a notch filter. Right. The notch filter would only notch out a small fraction of the, of the spread signal. Okay, I would easily be able to handle that. All right. But it's inherently easier to do with frequency hopping, especially if you have extremely strong jammers. Okay. Um, 
So the, the frequency hopper can basically cut holes in the hop sequence if it encounters interference. If you use uh, burst error correcting codes like Reed Solomon codes that ride right through them, uh, direct sequence can use notch filters. But in practice, you know, we don't do that in our system. But first of all, in our system, we're we're not running in a totally uncontrolled environment. Okay, we're running it on spectrum that's been cleared. It's only CDMA in one given area, and we're after maximum capacity and all the other benefits of direct sequence. So we don't really have this problem. But in a in a general ham environment or a part 15 environment where you really can't control who your neighbor, what your neighbors are doing, you know, frequency hopping seems to have the edge here. You know, Mike. Sure. Sure. Yeah, in, in principle, you can deal with narrowband interference in either system. Okay, I'm saying it's a practical matter. Okay, a practical, easy to implement system, frequency hopping seems to be better. But in theory, yeah, you can do it either way. If you're after maximum process gain, okay, you're trying to you're trying to spread over the widest possible bandwidth given the, a, a certain data rate. Again, this is something in theory you can do with either system. Okay, there's no inherent limit on either direct sequence or frequency hopping. But as a practical matter, it seems to be easier to, to, to spread wider using frequency hopping because I can I can hop over a pretty wide range using these direct digital synthesizer chips. With direct sequence, everything has to be, you know, all the, the, the chips have to be generated at this very high rate. I have to acquire at these very high rates, which means very, very narrow correlation peaks and so forth. Okay, so as a practical matter, it seems easier to use uh, frequency hopping if I want maximum process gain. Now, this is one of the reasons why hybrids are common in, in the real world. Omnitrax, which is a truck tracking um, and, uh, messaging system that we sell uh, to, mainly the, the, the truck companies, but also to railroads and some others, um, uses a direct sequence frequency hop hybrid. Basically, we take a direct sequence signal and then hop it. Okay, and the reason we do that was to meet the FCC limits on spectral density. We couldn't do it with direct sequence alone, okay? even though direct sequence was our preferred method of, of operation it was needed for ranging. But in order to meet the FCC requirements, we simply took that signal and hopped it over enough of bandwidth to, to cut the spectral density down to, to reach the, the limit. Yeah? That's right. Well, uh, in the jamming game, as they call it, you know, you go through the literature and, and you read up a this. So that's actually, that's what they call it, the jamming game. And what you're trying to do against an, an intentional jammer is to force them into wideband jamming. Okay? Because that's the worst. That's, that's, he can always do wideband jamming. He can jam everywhere you go, but that's the, that's the least efficient use of his power. Okay? So the whole idea is to force him to do wideband jamming. He can't tell where you are, or, or if he, he can't tell fast enough where you are that his only alternative is to spread his energy very widely over your entire band, which does the least damage to you. Okay. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment when I get to a fast frequency hopping. Okay, uh, I've been talking about fast and slow frequency hopping without really defining what it means. Uh, this is, seems to be the generally accepted um, definition. Uh, slow hopping is anything where the hop rate is less than the symbol rate of the underlying modulation. So, for example, the, the motor you're about to hear about in the next segment of the, of the seminar is a slow hopper. Even though it's hopping 100 times per second, it still is staying on each channel for something like uh, 6,000 data bit times. Okay? That makes it a slow hopper. Right? Um, fast hopping, on the other hand, is, is any fast frequency hop system where the hop rate is greater than the simple rate. Okay? We actually hop around several times before the system even finishes sending one data bit or one, or one uh, channel symbol. Okay? Slow hopping is easier to implement. Uh, the synthesizers don't have to tune as fast. Uh, you can actually use uh, coherent uh, demodulation or at least integrate your symbols over a longer time and get better signal edge performance with a slow hopper. Uh, fast hopping, on the other hand, has uh, some serious problems with um, performance. Because you're hopping around even faster than your data rate and because there's, there's a phase jump every time you do a frequency hop, you can't really coherently add or integrate the, uh, the information you get with each hop. Okay, so you, you pay a penalty for this. It's called a non-coherent combining loss. Okay. However, there's one application where fast hopping is, is worth all this, this grief, and that is in a battlefield situation against an intelligent jammer. Imagine a, a slow frequency hop system where the, the hopping sequence is generated by, crypt, by a cryptographic variable, a cryptographic sequence, so it can't be predicted in advance. But you're hopping so slow that the jammer basically uh, uh, adopts the strategy of listening to where you've gone and then jamming you, following you there. Okay. And then it waits you know, another 10 milliseconds, and then he follows you wherever you've gone. Okay, you now you can put all his energy on top of wherever you happen to go, even though he can't predict your hopping sequence. Right? Now, if you can hop fast enough, you can, you, can, you can defeat this. If you can hop faster than this round trip speed of light delay to the jammer and back, then he can't do this, right? Because by the time he finds out where you are, you've gone. You've gone somewhere else. All right? 
So there are, as I understand it, and I haven't been able to find much information about it, there are military anti-GM <laughs> systems that work this way, okay? They don't like to talk about them much, but, you know, I mean, the laws of physics are, are there for everyone, and you can sort of infer, you know, what the, how they must work, because even black projects have to obey the laws of physics. Um, which is, of course, something, a new concept of the Strategic Defense Initiative people, but anyway. So, uh, yeah, was there a question in the back? I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you start again, please? That's right. Right. Well, he may, he may have some equipment limitations, right? But, I mean, his equipment limitations are you know, a function of the state of the art. You may not know what it is. But if you base your system on a fundamental physical limit that you know you can't beat, you know, then, then you're safe. <laughs> well, they might, you know. So, so um, so we don't see too many fast frequency hoppers in practice. Now you can also talk about a medium hopper, say one that hops in every symbol, and I think that actually has a lot of, it, a lot of things going for it. Um, so here's some examples of direct sequence spread spectrum. Um, these are the ones I know best. There are others, but these are the ones I want to talk about in a little bit of detail since I know these and, and probably familiar, increasingly familiar to many of you. Uh, GPS and an IS95 CDMA, this is what we developed for, for digital cellular applications. And that was in further, and it's further divided into the forward reverse length because the modulation is spreading it different on those two directions. Okay, the GPS um, is also a data communication system. It's um, very slow, it's 50 bits per second, and it's used mainly just to get the data into the receiver needed to do tracking, but nevertheless there is a data communication problem here to be solved. So they use uh, forward error correction coding on a navigation message. There's a very simple handing block code that adds six bits of parity for every 24 bits of data. Um, if you look in the uh, error specification for the GPS signal formats available on the Coast Guard website. You'll, you'll see this described in great detail. Uh, the data modulation is BPSK, 50 symbols per second. That's after the handing code has been added. Uh, the frames take 30 seconds to transmit. Um, and then that signal is in turn BPSK spread using direct sequence on the CA channel, which is the only channel that most civilian receivers pay attention to. Uh, that spreading is at 1.023 megachips per second, so that the sequence, the spreading sequence, repeats exactly once every millisecond or a thousand times per second. So it goes through all possible chips, chipping um, values. Um, there is a secondary channel uh, that Tom and I, Tom and I talked about earlier, which most civilian receivers don't use. It's reserved for the military, called the P channel or precision channel. Uh, that is also BPSK spread uh, on the same carrier but at, a, at 10 times the chipping rate, 10.23 uh, million chips per second. Uh, or the clear access channel on L1, which is the 15,750-something frequency that, that most civilian receivers use, the P channel is, is sent in quadrature with the clear access channel. In other words, they can be separated by a, a modem that covers carrier phase. You can select either the, 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 the P or the CA channel. In fact, with a CA receiver, the P channel is just quadrature noise is rejected. It's also on a second frequency called L2, which is down in 12, 20 something, 12, 40 range, I believe it is. I don't know the exact frequency. Uh, the reason why GPS uses two frequencies, L1 and L2, uh, with the same information transmitted on both, is to allow the user, at least the, the military users that have the, the dual frequency uh, receivers, to determine the propagation delay, the initial propagation delay through the ionosphere due to the electron content of the ionosphere, which increases the refractive index of the propagation path and slows down the way it would otherwise affect the, the timing measurements. By measuring the time delays, the difference in time delays between these two known frequencies, you can determine what the absolute delay is in either one of them and correct for the ionospheric propagation delay. A single frequency receiver, um, delay receiver, has to rely either on the uh, estimate of the ionospheric corrections that are transmitted down with the navigation message, or they have to rely on the corrections from a differential station somewhere in the neighborhood that's seeing the same errors. You can, yes. There are some codeless uh, receivers, and you know I'm not really the one to go into the Tom is the, is the expert on these things. Um, speak of the devil. Um, <laughs> it is possible. 
it is possible to make use of the PCO without even knowing what it is, because most in, in normal operations, I understand the PCO is encrypted. The PCO itself is actually published, but it's normally encrypted in, in normal operations by something called a Y code, which only the authorized military receivers have. But there are receivers that can make use of this code with some loss in performance to, to, to be able to uh, measure the ionospheric dispersion uh, value directly rather than having to rely on the navigation message or on a, a differential beacon station. Okay, um, that pretty much exhausts my uh, understanding of GPS. It actually is also a much simpler system than the, the I-25 cellular system. Uh, if you want to read in more detail, there is a complete document on the Coast Guard website, the NASDAQ website, that has the complete area based spec for, for GPS, if you really want to go into excruciating detail. Uh, now we talk about a system that I've been working on, helping work on at Qualcomm. There are pointers in the Tapper website to the NASDAQ site. Good. Yeah, that's the document I was thinking of. Right. Okay. Uh, now we talk about a system that I've been working on, helping work on at Qualcomm with a cast of thousands for the last uh, six or seven years. Um, this is now becoming deployed. It's real. You can go out and buy it. I'm not sure uh, what the status is in this area. Uh, Sprint is selling at Sprint PCS in most of the country now. Many of the cellular companies, the regular cellular companies, are also deploying it. Uh, about the only place that really doesn't exist yet is, is Europe because Europe has their own standard called GSM, which is a TDMA digital standard. I think, yeah, in Washington it's Sprint Spectrum, which is the only place where they're using it. But everywhere else, Sprint PCS is TDMA, this stuff I'm about to describe. Okay. In a, in a cellular system, um, most of you are probably familiar with the basic concepts of cellular. You're reusing frequencies geographically so you can get the carrying capacity of a limited number of channels off over a metropolitan area. Um, until the digital systems came along, these all used FM. FM has a capture effect, which is nice, which is why it was chosen over single sideband um, for, for mobile. But it has a rather high signal noise ratio requirement for that capture to occur. Uh, you know, the usual engineering parameter is you need about 17 dB C to I ratio to allow for fading to get good quality uh, FM in a cellular system. Uh, in order to maintain a 17 dB carrier interference or signal interference ratio in a cellular system, you can't reuse every frequency in every cell. And that should be fairly obvious. If you were on the border between two cells, if you were equidistant between two cells, and those cells are both transmitting on the same frequency at the same time, you would, in theory, get the two signals at the same signal level, which would be a zero dB signal noise ratio, and that wouldn't work. Okay. So to make a cellular system work with FM, they only assign about a seventh of the channels to any particular cell. Okay. This is an immediate cut on, an immediate hit on uh, capacity. Okay. So they only use one seventh of each, each cell. Um, the CD main, on the other hand, because it's inherently um, good at discriminating against interference, it can actually operate with negative signal noise ratios in the spreading bandwidth. CDMA then allows you to use every frequency everywhere in every cell. Okay, so the CDMA systems out there all operate on the same frequency in a given area. Okay. And they don't actually go, have to go onto another channel until they exceed the capacity until the first channel fills up. But all the cells in a given area, when the system is first turned on, all operate on the same 1.25 megahertz channel. And you can separate them at the receiver because they are spread. They're, they're spread with different codes. Uh, the other features that are possible with IS-95 included this, this, this neat feature called soft handoff, where when you're moving from one cell to another, you don't have to do a hard switchover as happens now in AMPS. What happens now in AMPS is that you know you were sent a message, your phone switches the synthesizer from one channel to another, and you hear a little click in the uh, conversation. Hopefully, it gets better, not worse. And very often, you know, sometimes it gets worse. In fact, the call drops when that happens. But uh, in CDMA, you have the option of going through two cells at once because the receiver is capable of discriminating the two signals from the two different cells even when they're arriving at the same amplitude, or even when one's slightly stronger than the other. It's possible for the system to set up the cell, set up the call through more than one cell while you're in that transition region, and the mobile can actually combine the signals from the two cells into one high-quality data stream. Okay. Only when you move into, solidly into the territory of, an, of, the, of the second cell is the call drop in the first cell, and then you go into a, into a single cell situation. So that's one way that the quality is, is, is kept up in a, a cellular environment when you're moving around constantly from one cell to another, and in fact, maybe fading in and out of multiple cells you know, rather rapidly. Uh, the uplink is, is, is not actually combined on a bit-by-bit -bit basis. It's voted on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. So the reverse channel, it's possible, again, to have the call up on two, two cells at once, but the base station basically makes a voting decision very much like an FM voting repeater on a 20 millisecond basis, which is the length of the voice frame. Whichever one has a better quality and goes with it. 
it would be possible to do this, but it would involve sending all the symbols back, all the raw modulated, all the raw undermodulated symbols back to a central point to have them decoded, which would require much larger bandwidth in the back halls to go back to the switch. So it's possible to do, but it hasn't been done yet. Yeah. Correct. I'll get to that. Okay. Um, another feature of IS-95 that is, is something that's enabled by or uses spread spectrum is the variable rate vocoder. And the other digital cellular systems out there, such as GSM, a constant rate vocoder, in the case of GSM, 13 kilobits is used. So when, whenever you're up on a traffic channel, you're burning out 13 kilobits of system capacity, even if you're not talking. Okay. Now, I talked earlier on, the very beginning of my talk, about you know the drawbacks of orthogonal signaling and being that, you know, there's only so many of them to go around, and, and if you want to share them dynamically among users, you have to somehow reallocate them. Well, in the case of, of, of a cellular telephone system, you are reallocating on a per-call basis. But wouldn't it be nice if you could reallocate on a finer grain basis than, than a call? How about doing it on every syllable? Okay. With a CDMA system, you can do that because you can give everybody a code. Codes are cheap. They're plentiful. I give everybody their code, but they don't actually have to use it unless they actually have something to set. All right, so imagine a, a, a CDMA system where the vocoder varies its rate depending on whether you're saying anything. If you stop talking, it idles at a low rate, and when you start talking, it, it kicks up to a high rate. And imagine a transmitter that's trying to work with that vocoder such that when it has something to send, it turns on, it, it goes to high power or whatever is required for the data rate, and then when you stop talking, it idles at a low rate, it throttles back its power proportional to the data rate. Okay? This is very easy to do in CDMA because there's no coordination that's required to do this. You just do it. Okay? So on average, all the users are now using only about half as much power and half as much system capacity as they would be if I had to give them all peak capacity all the time for the duration of a call. Okay. So if we look at the forward link in IS-95, the forward link is defined as the base to mobile link. That's the, that's the forward direction. Uh, we can see uh, the, the, the pieces or the, the selections that were made for each of the building blocks in the, in the diagram I showed earlier of a spread spectrum, generic spread spectrum system. The coding is convolutional coding, uh, rate one half, that is, there's a parity bit added for every data bit. Uh, constraint length nine, which is fairly high for convolutional codes, but the data rate's low, so it wasn't too hard to implement. The higher that number, the better uh, performance you get, but the uh, more costly it is to implement. So that was chosen as a trade-off, as a trade-off that we, we picked for the system. Um, that actually applies only to the full rate, that is the 9.6 kilobit rate that I, that I mentioned uh, for the vocoder as the, as the primary rate. Uh, there are lower data rates, and the way this is done is you simply repeat symbols from the, the, the encoder, so that you're essentially operating lower code, or, uh, lower code rates, so you drop the data rate while keeping the channel symbol rate constant, and that makes, it, makes the implementation nice and simple uh, passive coder, because it doesn't know anything about the variable rate. Uh, so you're actually dropping the composition coder rate at the lower data rates down to the lowest 116 for the, the lowest rate. Uh, there's interleaving built into this because, it is, after all, it's a fading channel. It's a mobile communication system, and, and these, these channels do fade. Uh, so we interleave, that is, we scramble the order that, which is the encoded symbol to send over the channel over a 20 millisecond interval so that if there's a fade that takes out a piece of that, we can go back and fill in that uh, fade using the, the redundant symbols and the, and the rest of the, of the, of the frame. Uh, this figure is the trade-off between delay and fade tolerance. The longer the interleaver, the better in terms of dealing with fading, especially slow fading. But of course, this delay also factors into what the user hears when, he, when he's talking, and, and long delays are very annoying if you're, if, you're, if you're trying to carry on a conversation. So the 20 millisecond frame was, was chosen as a trade-off between fade tolerance and, and delay. The modulation uh, is, is VPSK at 19.2 kilosymbols per second. The, the basic data rate is 9.6. Multiply that by, uh, or divide that by the, the coding rate, you get 19.2 kilosymbols per second. And that's true for all the, the data rates. By keeping the the, uh, the symbol rate constant, the rest of this stuff can be can be the same regardless of the data rate that the, that the user is actually using in a given 20 millisecond frame. Uh, the uh, modulated signal is then channelized using these, uh, using a 64 area Walsh code uh, with one of the channel reserved for a power reference that's used to acquire the, the, the short code when the mobile starts up, as I talked about earlier. Uh, again, you can think of these Walsh codes as really being subcarriers. You can think of the zero channel, the pilot being the carrier exactly what it is. It's a carrier. Once it's unspread, it's just unmodulated carrier. And the receivers use that as a phase reference for modulating the, the other channels coherently. Uh, each of the other WASP code channels can be thought of as a subcarrier on that carrier. So a user is actually assigned one of these subcarriers at the time that the call comes up. 
Once the channelization is done, it then keeps the escape spread at 1 point, uh, about 1.25 mega, megajets per second, and that is the fact that our balance is the channels are 1.25 megahertz uh, spacing. We use a pretty tight filter to uh, make sure that the uh, swap or the adjacent channels is kept out on a minimum. So you get a pretty, almost rectangular waveform uh, on a spectrum analyzer when you look at the signal. Uh, in fact, the uh, filter is so tight that the uh, top of it has a, uh, it has a fair amount of ripple. So if you look on a spectrum analyzer, you're tuning to the cellular band. Naughty, naughty. Um, now, of course, the modulating any signals, of course, is looking at the waveforms, right? You will see, if you see something that looks like this on a spectrum analyzer, it rises up and you see a little ripple like this and it comes down and this is 1.25 megahertz. The very sharp spurs, you found a CDMA IS95 signal. And you'll, you'll probably see those if you tune around the 900 megahertz, the 800, 900 megahertz cellular band. This particular uh, waveform has a has an affectionate term within Qualcomm because of the ripple here in the top. We call it the Bart's head. It the top of it. Bart Simpson's head. Um, in fact, I think it even has the same number of ripples as the number of spikes it says. But that's just due to the, it's just an artifact of the digital filter that's used to, to band limit this thing. And these, these skirts are quite sharp because we wanted to protect adjacent channel operation that may be FM in the same area. Yeah. That's right. There are 64 channels. So you build a 64 by 64 matrix that I that I. Right. Well. Okay, that's in the reverse, okay, uh, that actually, the CDMA actually only applies here in the reverse channel, because strictly speaking, IS-95 is CDMA only in the reverse channel, because that's the only direction where there's multiple access. In the forward direction, you have one transmitter transmitting to multiple users. Okay, so it's spread, but it's not really CDMA. We still spread it because we want to be able to reject interference from other cells. We want to be able to do the soft handoff trick. But strictly speaking, only half the system is CDMA. Only half of it has to be CDMA because that's in the other direction you're going from many transmitters to one to one receiver. Okay. So it's a little confusing because we do use Walsh codes on both directions. We'll use them for very different reasons. In the forward direction, we use them basically as channels to keep the users independent from each other. In the reverse direction, we actually use it as a modulation coding technique. Okay, so the... Um, Forward link has this thing called a pilot, which is analogous to a carrier. In fact, it is a carrier uh, that is spread only by the short code. That short code is common to all cells. It's in the standard. It's a polynomial that's, that's defined. Um, and the reason we have a pilot is to simplify the mobile. The mobile, when it first turns on, looks for that pilot. And, and it, it, it can't operate without that pilot. The pilot has to be there at all times for the, for the mobile to function. It used, it's used to generate a, a local uh, carrier reference for demodulating the, 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 the actual traffic channels and it's used for time tracking and it displays everything in the mobile to that timing. So it's the basic reference that, that the, the mobile has. Uh, this is accessible in the forward link. The, the, the energy that we spend on this is accessible because all this mobiles can share it. You know, every mobile can receive the same pilot. Okay. Um, it, because the, the, the PN sequence is relatively short, uh, it can be acquired rather rapidly. Uh, signal noise ratio is usually fairly high. We run it a little bit hotter than the traffic channel. It has, the, uh, above, you know, has a fair amount of energy on it, a fair amount of power on it. So when you turn your phone on, it'll usually acquire within a few seconds, and that's just the time it takes to wrap around the, the sequence space and find, find the correlation peak for the nearest cell site. Uh, all cells, by the way, use the same PN code. You can use different offsets within this code. And because the code repeats rather rapidly, because it's a short code, we have to make sure that the cells don't drift into each other. You've got to make sure that the correlation peaks for different cells never collide. No matter where you are in the coverage area, you have to allow for the geometry, okay, the geography of the area to make sure it doesn't happen. And the way we make sure that the cells don't collide with each other is we use GPS. Okay, so every cell site has a GPS receiver with a one pulse per second output and a 10 megahertz, you know, highly stable oscillator that is that is, that is slaved to the, to the GPS clock so that all the cells have a common time base. And all their spreading codes are in fact controlled by GPS. So if you want to take down a, a, a CDMA system, all you have to do is jam GPS. So it makes us a little bit nervous at times thinking about this. But, um, <laughs> In fact, we've looked at ways of, of, of making the system a little bit more tolerant to GPS outages where they can somehow, you know, agree on a phase with each other directly. This is kind of hard. GPS was the easiest way to go. And in fact, most of the, I think most of the, um, the timing receivers have Rubidium clocks in the backup in case we do lose GPS. In the early days, the GPS constellation wasn't complete, and we actually had to run, you know, flywheel on, on these Rubidium clocks until the constellation was built out. So, uh, that's the forward link. 
um, has a pilot, and the traffic channels are multiplexed using these Walsh codes, and you can think of them as really a subcarrier. So each user gets a, a separate subcarrier when it's main carrier. Um, I talked earlier about the, the notion of uh, soft handoff uh, between uh, cells. This is how it's done. Uh, there's one of these in every CDMA phone. The device called a rake receiver. And the rake receiver has actually been around for a long time, a surprising long time. I think it was invented in the late 50s or, or early 60s. Uh, it's called a rake receiver because it looks like a rake. You know, here's the, the handle and here's the, the piece of the rake. Uh, what you have is, is a common uh, RF front end or IF front end which feeds several parallel receivers, uh, each one of which can be tracking a slightly different PN offset because each one has its own separate code generator. It's tracking a separate, uh, can be tracking a separate PN offset. The outputs of these are then run through a combiner and then the uh, resulting uh, modulated signals are then fed on to the, the, the Turbi decoder and the, the rest of the phone. There's a fourth channel called searcher, which is also fed the raw IF from the, from the front end. And this job is just, as the name implies, to search for pilots. All it does is run around the sequence space, around all possible chips, two to two two the 15 possible offsets, looking for correlation peaks. The results of the search are fed to an onboard CPU, which then controls the individual receivers in the three uh, channels of the rate receiver. And I have a videotape later which actually shows this stuff in action. If we can, if we can find a, a, a VCR and a, and a TV set, I can show this actually happening in a phone as you drive around. But the advantage of the rake receiver is that you can, you can make multipath work to your advantage. Okay? If I have several multipath components, the searcher will see them all. It'll see a peak at each one of these. And it can assign each of the fingers of the rake receiver to the three strongest multipath components. Where in the case where it's in a soft handoff between two different cells, that's just a special case of multipath. This is coming from a different, a different uh, direction. Okay. So I can assign, again, let's say, for example, receiver 1 and 2 might be tracking two different components on one cell, and receiver 3 might be tracking a component from another cell, so I'm in a handoff case. But all this energy is then combined together before it's even demodulated. So as long as one of those paths is good at any instant, I have good quality data. Yeah, there's a, there's a point of diminishing returns here. It's also a function of the chip rate. The higher the chip rate, the narrower each of those peaks is, and the, the more uh, um, the separate, the, the more you're able to discriminate on on, on uh, very fine detail multipath, and the more these fingers you need to collect all the energy and put it back together. So three was chosen as a as a as a reasonable trade-off for the chipping rate that we used and for the cost constraints that we had. Again, this is all implemented in VLSI logic, you know, in, in an IC, so it's relatively cheap to, to replicate this. So this is this is somewhat analogous to the multi-channel receivers you get now with GPS, which goes against 12 channels. But there, you're not trying to modulate multipath, you're actually trying to get rid of multipath. But in GPS, you're trying to track 12, up to, well, eight satellites, I guess, is the maximum you ever see at any one time. Here, you're, you're tracking both combinations of multipath and separate cells, which are like separate satellites in the GPS case. So I talked about uh, soft handoff. It's only done in the forward length um, uh, direction. The reverse length uses a very simple voting scheme. In principle, it could be done in the reverse channel, but we didn't consider it to be Economical uh, use of backhaul bandwidth. Okay, now the reverse link is the length that goes from the cellular user to the base station. This is the one link that really has to be CDMA because you really do have multiple transmitters accessing the common receiver. Uh, the numbers here are a little bit different. We use a slightly lower rate code, a rate one third uh, convolutional code, and again we use uh, a lower rates for the, uh, the lower code rates for the lower data rates when the vote coder is idling it. At the, between speech, so, uh, speech, between speech first. And it's the same size frame that's actually uh, determined by the vocoder. The vocoder is the same in both directions. Now, the Walsh code here is used a little bit differently. We have a 64 um, area Walsh code, which here is actually used as a, as a forward correcting code, or as a modulation method. It's really the same thing, which is, again, why the boundaries here are blurring a little bit. When you draw up a 64 area uh, Hadamard matrix, You've got 64 columns, 64 rows. Okay. You can represent any one of those rows by a 6-bit number because 2 to the 6 is 64. So the way I modulate a group of 6 bits in, in this reverse link is I take a group of 6 bits and then I look up the row number that corresponds to that 6-bit number, and then I transmit symbols in that row, all 64 of them. So for every 6 bits that go in, 64 bits come out. Okay, so I'm increasing the bandwidth here already by a factor of 10, which is, you know, puts me up in the spreading category, which is why I say this is actually a form of spreading. It's also a form of poor air correction coding because it actually reduces the power required uh, to signal at a given data rate. Okay, so 
By the time I have uh, convolutionally encoded the, the data, I run it through this, this Walsh intercode, I'm already up to 307.2 kilosymbols per second. Okay, now I spread it by another factor of four to bring me up to the same bandwidth as before. And then the spreading here is done the same way. There's actually two codes. There's the long code, which is assigned per user, and there's the short code, which is, which is used for everything. Okay, it's done with QPSK spreading uh, for the short code, and then the signal reaches the antenna at that point. Now, in this direction, because it's CDMA, the near-far problem applies to full force. Okay, we want to make sure that all the users arrive at the cell with the same amount of power. Okay, this is very important because if someone were to come in 20 dB stronger than everyone else, he would jam out everyone else. Because, again, the receivers cannot completely reject uh, all the unwanted signals. They, have, they, they do have a response. In order for this to work, all the signals have to arrive at very, close, uh, very closely matched power levels. So to do this, we use both an open and a closed-loop power control scheme. The open loop scheme is very simple. The mobile looks at the AGC on its receiver and then sets the transmit power inversely proportional to that so that the sum of the received and transmit powers in dB are constant. It's about 73 dBm squared is the proportionality constant. Okay. Now this would work fine if the two links were exactly symmetrical. This, is, this would be all I'd have to do. You know, if I get close to the cell, I back off of my power. Okay, if I go away from the cell, receive power goes down, transmit power goes up, and I'm arriving at the cell at constant power. The problem is that the two links don't fade directly um, uh, together, okay, because they are operating 45 megahertz apart. It's a full duplex system uh, with duplexers, and the two channels don't fade together. They, they, they fade independently. So this will get you within about 8 dB or so of the correct value. But that's not good enough. You want to get within a dB or so. So the way we get the rest of the way is to use what's called a closed loop power control system. The cell actually measures the, the power of each user as it arrives at the cell and then tells the user whether it's too weak or too strong. And he does that 800 times per second. All right. The way he does that is actually quite clever. Uh, on the forward link, I mentioned that this, the, the, this, the, the data going out is convolutionally encoded. That means it can tolerate some errors. It can tolerate some losses. So what they do is 800 times per second, they simply gate off the data stream and stick in a power control bit. Okay. Now, the reason they have to do this is because if they put this into the data frame, it would be too late. By the time it got there, it would be 20 milliseconds for the deinterleaving to take place. And by the time you got the data bit, it would be too late to use it. So this loop has to be very, very tight. And the way they do this is by not coding it. So they simply puncture out at 800 hertz rate from the encoded data stream on the forward channel a, a spot for this power control bit, which is just one bit. So it's go up or go down by 1 dB. Okay. What you've got now is a closed servo control loop from the cell side out to the mobile and back that's saying whether it should go up or go down. Now, this, this bit is not coded. It has no protection on it. Okay. It can be errored. That's okay because there's another one coming along, you know, less than a millisecond, a little more than a millisecond later, that will tell you again to go in the proper direction. Okay. So what you have here is a closed servo loop that is driving the mobile towards the right power. Okay. And it does this at 800 hertz rate. So if, for example, uh, the links start to diverge because one has more attenuation on the other because of a, you know, one, one link is fading, the other one is not, uh, the cell will see that as an imbalance in power because the mobile will start wrapping its power up or down and, you know, and going away from the nominal set point. The cell site will see that and will start saying, no, go down, go down, go down, or go up, go up, go up bits. Okay? And, there, and since each one of those bits says go up or go down by 1 dB, and you're sending it 800 times per second, it means the maximum slew rate here is 800 dB per second, okay? which is pretty fast. Okay? So the power control here is really quite tight. It, it works very well. What you see at the cell site, is a very nice normal distribution, the galaxy distribution centered around the nominal set point with a standard deviation of about dB or less. Okay, so that, so that problem is solved. Yeah, Mike. So the, so the is up, down, down, down. That's right. Yeah, if you're right on, what you'll get is an up, down, up, down, up, down. It's like delta modulation. You know, it, it averages out to, to right on. So if you're, if you're too low, on average, the bits will say go up. And if you're too high, there, on average, the bits you get will say go down. And all errors do is cause the loop to take a little bit longer to close, but it's still stable because of the close feedback loop. Okay. Uh, if, you're, if you're in a soft handoff situation, um, each cell is sending its own power control stream. The receivers do the or the down. In other words, either cell tells you to go down, you go down. Only when both of them tell you to go up, do you go up. And that makes sense because if you're, you're, close, if you're closer to one cell, then you don't want to jam that one in order to get to the other one. <laughs> All right. So you use the or the, or the down is the, is the procedure is used there. Yeah. Yeah, actually, it's, it's AM modulated in several ways, um, and you can actually hear this on a scanner. Okay, um, 
let me, let me get let me get back to that. In fact, it shows up very nicely on the uh, videotape that I have. If we can find something to show it on later. Okay. The reverse link has no pilot. The reason it has no pilot is because here there's only one user to cover the cost of that pilot. In the forward link, we have one pilot who's shared by up to 61 users, actually. Okay. In, the, in the reverse link, there's only one user on that transmitter. So a pilot is considered inefficient, at least at the time the system was designed. Uh, it is, however, being revisited for the next generation, the possibility of adding a, you know, basically a carrier component back that the cell site can use to, to modulate the signal coherently. Because there's no coherent carrier reference, we use 64 area orthogonal modulation. That is, you pick the row of the matrix and you send those 64 wall chips corresponding to a given 6 bit value. Uh, that actually provides pretty good performance, especially when you combine it with the convolutional code. We can operate down on a non-fading channel. We can operate with EB right zero down of around 3 to 4 dB. And on a fading channel, it rises to about 6 or 7 dB. Okay. It's, a, it's a penalty of running on a rarely fading channel. So it actually provides pretty good performance, even without a, a coherent pilot. But there's some discussion about possibly adding one to the next generation. Uh, when I say that the, the modulation is incoherent, that's not strictly true. It's, it's not coherent from one symbol to the next. Each symbol that's sent can be completely have a totally random phase in the previous one, which is why it can adapt rapidly to a, to a fading channel. Uh, but over each individual code word, there, there's a coherent integration being done. Okay, so when I say that it's non-coherent, it's actually only non-coherent from one symbol to the next. The same is true with FSK. If you have, uh, say, binary FSK, and you have a, a pair of filters while looking at each tone. That filter is basically doing a coherent integration over one bit time or one, one baud interval okay, of that tone. And if it takes to the channel, it's changing very rapidly, very extremely rapidly for, for high-speed FSK, then it's possible for that filter not to produce the correct output. Now, another way of looking at this is if the, if the channel is fading that rapidly, what's actually happening, the channel is aiming the signal and it's creating sidebands that are pushing the energy out of the filter so the filter will miss it. It's another equivalent way of looking at it in the frequency to make. So these schemes, although they're they're very good at working on fading channels, still have limits. I mean, if the channel phase is changing extremely rapidly, then you're really stuck. Okay? But fortunately, the channels here, although they fade rapidly, they don't fade at the symbol rate. They fade at something, something less than that. And I mentioned earlier that uh, the way the coding works is that we puncture the frames and run at lower rates. Uh, well, the, 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 the coding runs at a lower rate uh, when the data rate drops down. And then we actually gate the transmitter off, in the case of the forward length, to keep the power down. Okay, if we if we kept a constant power as we reduced the data rate, then the EB or zero would go up. If we went to say half rate, uh, the half rate data rate, and we're using the same amount of transmitter power to send half as much data, that means the energy per bit is doubling. We're going up by three dB, which is wasteful. We don't need it. So what we actually do is in the transmitter of the mobile. If you go to lower data rates, the transmitter is actually randomly gated off to keep the average power uh, where it should be. So if you're transmitting at full rate, the transmitter goes on and stays on. The envelope is a, is a constant envelope, except it's dithering up and down because of power control. And as soon as you fall down to lower data rates, the transmitter is now being randomly gated on and off. You'll actually hear that in a scanner. It's something like a motorboating sound if you tune across the, the TDMA reverse channel waveform. Okay. Um, so that's, that's what you'll see, the amplitude modulation of the, uh, of the waveform. You'll see the power control dithering up and down, and you'll see this random gating on and off that happens at the lower data rates. Yes. The way, the way that works is another uh, clever little scheme. They actually have four demodulators, four decoders, and they actually try to decode the frame four different ways, and whichever one works is the one they go with. Okay. Uh, that's another one of the things that they, that they put into the system. I, I thought it was maybe a bit extreme. I mean, you know, being a pack of data guy, I would just would have put a header one with two bits saying what the rate is. But, you know, they thought this was clever, so that's the way they did it. <laughs> they got a patent on it, too. So. Uh, okay. Um, I mentioned that virtual decoding is used in both of these directions, the convolutional coding. Um, this, um, one of the nice things about virtual decoding is it allows you to use soft decision decoding, which I talked about in my, my tutorial on, on coding. Uh, this typically picks up about 2 dB over codes that uh, can't use soft decision decoding. Soft decision decoding is simply the ability to look at the quality of each received symbol. Instead of slicing it immediately to either a 1 or a 0, you carry through quality information and say this is a really good one or a really good zero or a really you know, poor one or a poor zero. And the decoder can make use of this information in making its decisions about which sequence was probably transmitted. And the improvement in practice is about 2 dB, which is you know, nothing to see about. 2 dB 
in a CDMA system is almost a factor of two in capacity. 3 dB would be a factor of two in capacity. So we're after every dB we can get, and that's why we use soft precision decoding. Um, it, it, this is relatively easy to do with a four link, where it's a fairly straightforward TSK with a coherent carrier reference. On the reverse channel, we still do it. Uh, rather than, in the receiver, when we demodulate this reverse light waveform, we again take these 64 rows of this, of this, uh, of this head aware matrix, and we correlate each one of them against the received incoming signal. We don't actually do it that way. We do something called a fast Hadamard transform, but it's conceptually the same thing. It's just like taking, in the, in the, in the, um, uh, the case of the, of the HF modem we heard about yesterday, doing an FFT and then looking to see which bin is the strongest. We do exactly the same thing except it's done using um, a Hadamard uh, transform, but the math and the, the results are exactly the same. You, then, you could then say, okay, I'll pick the bin with the strongest energy and say that is the one that was sent and these are the six bits that were sent. Uh, you can do that and it will work, but you can do better by not throwing away all the other bins. You can actually say, okay, um, if say two bins are very close in amplitude and all the other ones are, are down in the noise, I can say that, well, for some of these bits, I'm really sure because if the, if the bits are the same for the, if certain bits are the same for these two bins, then I know that those bits are probably very high quality, but the bit that is different between those two bins is the one I don't really know very well. Okay. So we actually do that. We actually go ahead and do that. We actually look at all possible bins and then try to try to put a quality figure of each individual bit before we send it to the modulator, and that picks up a couple extra dB. The same technique is, is, is applicable to uh, to uh, if, uh, use the convolutional coding on, on HF, which I think would be a worthwhile extension to the work we saw yesterday. Right. Right. These, these, these orthogonal schemes have been around for a long time, but they're really very powerful. You've had the bandwidth to use them. They are very easy to implement using fast Fourier transforms, and, they, and by themselves, you can make n big enough, you get very good performance. In fact, if you can take n to infinity, you go to the Shannon limit, you know, minus 1.6 dB with no extra work. Now, that's not practical, okay? All right, but you can you can do very well by using practical values of them. So this, I think, is a technique that is, has a lot to say for it for fading channels, moon bounce, uh, land bubble, HF, and so forth. Okay, um, I, the, the data rates and code rates that I've given earlier were, were called IS95 rate set one. Uh, the, vote, the maximum vocoder data rate in that case was eight kilobits. The, some of the telephone companies wanted a better speech quality vocoder, so we gave them one uh, that ran at 13 kilobits peak rate. And to support this data rate, all we did was just puncture the convolutional code and increase the code rate. So that the reverse link, rate one half code becomes a rate three quarter code, and the, uh, I'm sorry, the forward link becomes a rate three quarter code, and the reverse link becomes a rate one half code. Everything else stays the same. Because one nice thing about coded systems is that if you can make your data rate changes out of the code level, everything else stays the same. Okay, and you don't have to uh, have a mode switch there. Uh, there is a cost to this because the code rates are higher, the coding gain is somewhat smaller, and each user is using more capacity because you're sending at a higher rate. So there is there's a cost here in capacity, but the carriers made this sort of decision and we we honored it. Okay. Um, that's it for IS-95. Uh, there's much more information available, again, on my webpage. There's a very nice document on the use of CDMA in, in cellular telephone networks you're welcome to read. Um, I don't have as much information about frequency hop spread spectrum. Um, I have, I keep hearing repeatedly that it's used in these, these military anti-jam modems. Uh, I believe it's also used in some commercial Part 15 modems, but, you know, details are kind of hard to obtain in, in both of these fields. You know, the military stuff tends to be classified, the military stuff, and the, the um, commercial stuff tends to be proprietary. Um, but from what I know about the, te the technology here and the uh, and the, uh, the basic mathematics, uh, the coding that would probably make the most sense when really combined with frequency hop spread spectrum would be either read solomon coding or uh, what's called dual state convolutional code, which is a generalization of a convolutional code to a higher order alphabet. Uh, it's because these, these MRE FSK schemes are a natural fit to frequency hopping. Um, just going to eight area FSK already gets you to us uh, that was going into the process, into the, into the spreading process. This is not true. Andy Perturby wrote a classic paper on the myth of spread spectrum back around 1979 that squashed this particular myth. So port error correction coding never decreased this process gain. In fact, it, in, it can increase it by adding coding gain. Um, by decreasing the, the signal noise ratio requirements, uh, port error correction not only makes the, the QRM that you cause other users lower, but it also makes you more tolerant of QRM from others. These two factors, you know, sort of reinforce each other, which is why system capacity is such a strong uh, function of EBRN0, which is in turn a strong function of coding. So 
any real modern spread spectrum system really has to have coding and has to be an integral part of the motor for it to, to work efficiently. Convolutional coding is a natural for uh, direct sequence uh, because of the ability to do soft decision and get good coding gains. And it's a good match for the module, the binary modulation schemes that are usually used with uh, com with uh, direct sequence. Uh, frequency hopping, because it tends to, because these fast hoppers tend to use MRE modulation uh, with larger alphabet sizes, uh, read Solomon codes are a nice fit to that. But you can also adapt uh, convolutional codes. One of the other factors to keep in mind when designing a code for a frequency hopper system is if the major source of errors is interference, narrow interference that you can land on for a whole hop, whatever code you pick has to be good at dealing with the burst of errors. Convolutional codes by themselves are not, unless you interleave them. Reed Solomon codes are inherently good at dealing with this, although even Reed Solomon codes should probably be early to, to work on a channel like that. This is an idea I've been kicking around for a while that we could actually do with the, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, modem we'll hear about next. If you have a relatively station, stationary, uh, persistent narrowband QRM on a couple of channels in a frequency hopper, you could actually have the modem uh, adapt to that interference pattern. One way to do it is to send back a uh, feedback report to the sender and go to a different hopping sequence that emits the, the, the channels that, you're, that, are, that, are, that are jammed. But you don't have to do that with coding. One simpler way of doing this is simply turn the transmitter off when you would otherwise transmit on a channel that you know is jammed. And if you have enough coding, you can just ride right through it. And coding would still in the holes. Right? So you don't have to have to change your, your hopping sequence. You can just turn it off to avoid, have, avoid generating unnecessary interference on that narrowband channel. And the poor error correction code, error correction code will just ride through it if you have enough redundancy in the code. Yeah, that's right. In, in the case, uh, the case of the, the modem you hear about next, that's true. So you would need a lot of interleaving to do that, but it could be done. I mean, it's, it's quite practical. And I've suggested running a read solving code with interleaving on top of the code they've already got. That's right. That's right. One problem with uh, with these large, you know, powerful coding schemes, they tend to apply very long block lengths. You don't actually have that data to send. You've got to pad it out, waste the channel, or you have to come up with uh, you know, families of block sizes, a large block and a small block and what have you. Yeah, yeah there, there is an inherent trade-off in coding. Okay, this is the thing you see in, in coding that between block size and, and performance. You can't make a good performing block code that is short. Because the way coding works is you're averaging, you know, everybody's basically going into a pool here. They're pulling all the all the bits are pulling all their energy into this into this block code. And the more you have, the better, the, the, the more reliable the results. Just like a large insurance company has a, you know, sort of inherent advantage over a small insurance company because of all large numbers. Same the exact same thing is true with coding. So you do have this you do have this this tension here between, you know, wanting to go to large and larger blocks to get the benefits of coding versus wanting not wanting to waste a lot of these blocks on small packets. That's right. You can pad it out, but, you, but one one thing some of them do is they come up with large a large block and a short block. You know, and you use kind of the best combination. So in in, in the case of uh, of a um, well, for example, in a file system, if you look at MS DOS, I mean, you have exactly the same problem. You have clusters and you have fragments. Well, in the case of Linux, you have clusters and fragments. In MS DOS, you just blow away, the, you know, just waste the whole block, which is why it's so easy to run an MS DOS file system out of space if you have a big cluster size. The exact same thing is true here. And, and, and at the physical disk drive level, the physical sector size is 512 bytes, you have no choice. I mean, you, you have to use the whole block or waste part of it. And it's, again, because of the coding it's using the drives to get the, get the performance up. Well, only if the... Uh, that's right, that's right. You can do that at a slower rate. You can once in a while go back to that channel and see whether you get it. But the nice thing about coding uh, is, is that you don't have to know in advance which channels are going to get hit. You just add enough redundancy to, to, to cover the expected number of channels that get hit, and then you'll ride right through it. Is there another question here? What the term is it's bad? Well, if you have, a, for example, a read Solomon code, that will tell you inherently, you know, that the code word won't decode. Or you'll, you'll, one of the things that falls out of the decoding process is it tells you where the errors are. And if the errors are always consistently in the same location, then you can just tell the transmitter, don't even bother trying to send there. I'll just fill them in. In fact, if the decoder knows ahead of time that this slot is empty, you can actually do a better job than if it has to figure out where the error is. You can actually do twice as, as good a job of the read solving code. You can do that, but that implies changing the hopping sequence and then resynchronizing at the other end. The advantage of this scheme is that you don't have to change the hopping sequence. It's all done out at the coding level, and the modem just keeps on doing its thing. 
except maybe that now it's muting the transmitter during the, 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 the hops when it knows it's hitting interference. Exactly, which, you know, to something we're, we've become sensitized to here in the AMS community, right? Yeah. right? This is why I'm suggesting this. Yeah. Right. But that's why I'm suggesting we do this, to make us, you know, make fewer enemies in the hand community here. Mm -hmm. but anyway, this, this is a scheme I think can be applied very nicely to this moment we're, we'll hear about next, which is why I bring it up. Yeah, well, remember, you're working, you're doing this based on feedback from the receiver, right? If the receiver can't hear it, then there's no point in sending it no matter what, right? <laughs> That's right. It, was, it does not guarantee you will never jam anyone. This is true, but, it'll, but it at least avoids unnecessary jamming, right? When it was clear that transmitting here won't do you any good, there's no point in doing it. Okay. So uh, some conclusions here um, is that of the two schemes, Frequency hopping is probably more suitable for general amateur use because of the mainly because of the practicality of dealing with narrowband interferers. Okay, because the ham radio bands are uncontrolled; they're not like cellular bands, and we're going to have to deal with narrowband QRM both directions. Okay, and it just seems easier right now, more practical to deal with this with the frequency hopper. Not that direct sequence doesn't have some very nice properties. Okay, um, the most appropriate use I think of direct sequence is probably on satellite channels. The near far problem is much less because everybody's at a relatively constant distance from the satellite transponder and the ability to range and track with direct sequence in a satellite environment can be you know, extremely useful for determining orbits and so forth. And we should also probably look at combinations, hybrids of direct sequence and frequency hopping so that we can get this best of both worlds um, approach. I think that's it. And the current rules, yeah, but we'll hear about regulations from Dwayne later on. But it was a temporary FBI. Okay, we're going to take a 10-minute uh, break. <laughs>